So in this session we are going to learn how you can install Splunk on a Linux server. So first thing which you need to do is uh, go to splunk.com and there you need to register yourself. So click here on free Splunk and then it is going to open up a sign up form. So you need to fill up all the details and then click here on software download and also you need to agree with the terms and conditions. So once you click on create your account you are going to be taken to this page. Okay, so this is the downloading page where you can download the software for Windows, Linux as well as for Mac OS. So since we want to install it on Linux, we are going to select Linux and then we are going to use RPM package. Okay, so click here on download now and then downloading should begin. Now uh, this software is going to get downloaded locally on this computer. Now let's suppose you want to download this software directly on the server. In that case you can come here on the right side and you can use download via command line. And click here and then copy everything. So I'm just going to copy everything. And then this is the server where we want to perform the installation. Okay so I'm just going to show, show you that current working directory is slash home slash splunk and right now we do not have any file or folder available here okay so, so this is the home directory of a user which is called splunk so i'm going to paste whatever we had copied and going to hit enter then it is going to download the software okay so once the software is downloaded then we can uh, go ahead and install it now in order to install the software we will also need a uh, sudo access okay so if you don't have sudo access make sure you get in touch with your linux admin who is going to give you sudo access so we are going to install it using sudo rpm i and then we need to give the name of this rpm which has been downloaded okay and then hit enter software is going to get uh, installed okay so now it is saying that splunk has been uh, successfully installed so if you get any warning you can ignore it until unless you get errors you can ignore any warnings so now uh, let's say now we want to see which directory Splunk has been installed. So by default Splunk gets installed into uh, slash opt directory. So we can move on to cd space slash opt, hit enter. And if you do ls here you can see there is a new directory which has been created which is called Splunk. So we are going to move inside Splunk directory and going to do ls again. Now you can see this is the structure which we have for Splunk. Okay, So we are going to move on to bin directory bin directory is the one which contains all the binaries so now from once you are in bin directory you can do ls and you can see there are all sorts of you know binaries available to perform various actions now what we want to do is we want to start splunk so we are going to do dot uh, slash splunk start and we can hit enter now in that case it is going to uh, show us all the terms and conditions or you can just press Control c to cancel this action and once it is cancelled now this time you can run uh, dot slash splunk start and then you can do hyphen hyphen accept hyphen license okay so in that case license is going to get auto accepted hit enter and now you can see it is asking for an admin username so when you log into uh, splunk for the first time it is going to be asking you one username and password so that is a this is a username which you create here which you use in order to log into splunk so i'm going to call it splunk admin and now i'm going to assign a password which is okay so i have assigned the password and now installation is taking place and also it is starting uh, the software okay so now it is saying everything has been done and splunk has been started so now what we can do is we need to go to the ip address on the port 8000 and we need to launch it on the browser so this is the ip address so i'm going to copy this ip address and then i'm going to move on to the browser and we are going to type this so here it is going to be the IP address of the system where you have installed Splunk along with the port 8000 and then hit enter and then it should be launching Splunk. Now when it launches for the first time you can log in with the Splunk admin ID which we have just uh, created it. So I'm going to use Splunk admin and the password which we have provided during the installation and now once we do that 
now we are logged into splunk for the first time okay so this is how simple it is if you want to install splunk on a standalone environment for your practice so see you in the next session so in this session i'm going to show you how we can quickly add row wise total and column wise total in splunk search so let's see what is the kind of data which we have so in this search i'm going to perform a search to uh, search data of windows event okay so all the event is going to be of type application and now let's say here we are interested in uh, source names and also we are interested in the type of uh, these logs so whether these are information whether these are warning or error and for source name we are going to have different uh, source name for each of these events so just to show you i'm just going to add table and let's add source name and let's add type okay hit enter and you will see that the information which we have is something like this so we have different source names and if you just click on next next you can see that these information are changing so here we have several other uh, types of source name and then also here in the type we have information we have warning and we have error as well okay so this is the kind of information which we are going to deal with and now I'm going to add, let's say we want to summarize it and we want to see each of the source names and also for each of the source name we want to see each of the types and we want to just see the count of all of those. So this is going to be the query. So we are going to use chart command and we are counting uh, each of the errors. Okay, so now we have error information and warning against each of the source name. Now uh, let's say here you want to have another column which is called total and you want to have row wise uh, total for each of these source names. Okay, so in that case if you are a Splunk beginner you might be uh, trying to perform addition of all of these columns. Okay, so you might be interested in performing addition of error information and warning and you may end up writing something like this which is uh, here you are performing evaluation. So basically you are performing an arithmetic uh, operation and the field name which you want to generate is called total and here you are performing uh, addition of error information and warning so you are trying to add error information and warning and if you click on search the result you get is the expected result which you wanted okay so you get total for each of these but uh, this is not probably a better way to do it because in Splunk we already have a command which can do this uh, addition for us and that command is called add totals so i'm just going to introduce it to you so you if you add add totals now you can see we are going to have a total okay and you can of course sort it so let's say if you want to see the total in descending order so you can just write total hit enter and now you can see all the you know the value which is higher is going to be coming on top Okay, so this is performing total for each of the row. Now, let's say you want to perform total for each column as well. So in that case, there is a parameter which is called call equal to tree. So what it is doing is you are asking it to perform column wise um, addition as well. Now click on search again. And in this case, you will see we have. Uh, now we have a first uh, first row, which is actually telling us a grand total for each of the column. Now the thing here is you don't see any information or any label here in the source name. So to enable the labels we have to type a label. Okay so I'm going to give it a label here and going to call it. So whatever you want to call it you can call it. Probably you can you can just write total here as well. Okay now along with label you also need to tell it uh, under which field this total should come. Okay so here we have source name and we want total to be displayed here in this column okay same under source name so we have to say it label field equal to source name okay so this label field this label of total is going to come under label field which is source name click on search And now you can see we have total here which is giving us information about row wise total for each of the source name and then we have total here as well which is giving us information about 
columnar so basically column wise a uh, total okay so we have a total of 24 events which is of type error and then we have 424 events which is of uh, type information and we have 11 events which is of type warning and overall we have uh, 459 events okay different events or so different types of uh, different combination of source name and uh, types okay so this is how uh, how easy it is to create uh, row wise or column wise total in splunk search thanks for watching so so in this video i'm going to show you how we can apply filters in splunk now the data set which i have for this example is the number of tweets which has been done for us elections and right now you are seeing the top 10 countries and the total number of tweets done in each of these countries and what is the percentage contribution from these countries now what if we want to focus on certain continents let's say i don't want to focus on all the continents i just want to see about a number of tweets which is done from asia continent okay so in this case as you can see now i have changed this filter to asia and now these values or this search dashboard is going to change okay so if you have requirement to create such kind of filters i'm going to show you how we can do that now first thing is we need to create the search queries okay so uh, whenever you create dashboard dashboard is basically made up of different or several search results okay so we need to create these uh, search results so first thing is to get these total tweets we have to uh, create a search query so i'm going to show you how we can do that so if I run this query, this gives me information about or basically this gives us events uh, information of all the tweets which has been done. Now let's say we want to focus on, you know, uh, total tweets. So in that case, we need to use a stats. So we can write like this. Okay, so we are going to use stats command. And what this is going to give us, this is going to give us a count of all the tweets which has been done. And now one thing you will notice here is uh, the data is going to be something like this. Okay, so it is telling you tweet count and it is not giving you uh, description which we have here. So for example, we also need these words we, which are called total tweets. Okay, so in this case, we will need to create another variable. So I'm going to use eval, okay, which is a... Uh, which is a command which you need to use whenever you are performing any calculations or any expressions okay so this is a syntax for that you write eval and this is a variable name so you can give any variable name here so i have just given a description or desc as a short form of description but you can write whatever you want now we want to write some a string okay so here i have written total tweets and whenever you want to write any strings you need to keep that in uh, quotes okay and now we are using dot op operator so dot operator is going to merge one string to another so this is going to merge uh, total tweets with tweet count okay so tweet count is this and whatever value you are getting here this is going to be merged in this string so now i want to show it in table and we want to see description okay so this time uh, the data which we are going to see is going to look like something like this okay so we see total tweets and then the value of total tweets now here if you notice i'm just using a visualization i'm not using a table so what we need to do here is click on visualization and you need to change this to single value so in my case it is already showing a single value but in your case if it is showing a bar chart or, or anything else you need to uh, change it to single value so this is the summary which we wanted and now we can save it as dashboard panel and i'm going to call it Plunk and US tweets filter demo. Okay, now we can save it and we can click on view dashboard. And now you will see that we already have summary ready. And now the other thing which we need to do is we need to add table and also we need to add a filter. So I'm just going to add the table first. Okay, so this is the table which we want to add. The query for this is pretty straightforward. So let's uh, create another search query we are going to make use of a top command so top command is going to uh, give us you know top 10 uh, top 10 countries if you want uh, top 20 countries then you can do that as well so here i'm going to write uh, top country and hit enter and now you can see we are going to have data about top 10 countries 
okay so here you need to change it from last 24 hours to whatever filter you want in my case i need to change it to all time that's how i'm going to see all the data and here we go we have now a top 10 countries and there is no filter about continent so it's just going to show top 10 countries uh, regardless of uh, whatever the continent these countries are from so now let's say if you want to focus only on top 5 countries then in that case you can do top uh, you need to give space and you need to specify uh, number so in this case I want to see top 5 and country okay so just do top 5 country and do a search again it's going to show you only top 5 countries this time okay so I'm just gonna change it back to top 10 and then I'm going to click on search and then we can save this dashboard okay and this time we are not going to create a new dashboard this time I'm going to just save it as a as an existing uh, save it as a panel in the existing dashboard which we have already created so we are going to go to existing and then go to Splunk US to its filter demo this is the one which we had created and then we can click on save and then click on view dashboard now you will see that we are going to have summary at the top and then we are going to have more detail in a tabular format so this is exactly what we wanted to see now uh, the now we need to add filters okay so in order to add filter we need to first know uh, the component in which we want to add the filter so in this case i'm just going to uh, take you again to search so here if i just uh, click on all time i'm going to make a search here and i just want to show you that we have continent field here okay so here you can see we have uh, continents okay so this is the we are going to use continents and for that we need to write table continent and this is going to give us list of all the continents uh, but the problem here is that we have continents in each field so you will notice that continent names are going to get repeated so many times now we don't want that we just want to want continents to be seen uh, as an unique values okay so we don't want continents to be repeating so you can see here we we are going to have same values being repeated so that's why we need to use a deduplication command so for that we need to write dedu and we are going to write continent so in this case now the data which we are going to get is only the list of unique continents okay so that's all we were looking for and this i'm going to add in the filter okay so these are the continents and i'm going to add this in the filter so just copy this query search query and now we can go to the dashboard which we have created so this is a dashboard which we have now you can click on edit and then from here you need to uh, click on add input and click on drop down now in the drop down this is what you see and by default you see this label which is called field one so just click here on edit input and once you click on edit input here in the label you can change it and uh, wherever you are seeing field one now you are going to see whichever value you update it here okay so i'm going to uh, call it select continent and now token token is very important token is basically the name of the variable so this input uh, or this drop down box is going to be you know you can uh, say it uh, or you can treat it as a variable and whatever name is you are go, uh, giving here you need to refer to this drop down using this name okay so i'm going to call it uh, continent filter you can call it or you can give it whatever name you want and now we, we can scroll down and we can put whatever our search query was okay so this is the search query which was giving us the name of unique continents so we just need to copy it and we can paste it here in the search string and also notice uh, you need to make the right you know time frame so in my case i only going to get the data if i select all time so that's fine and now here in the field for label and field for value you need to provide uh, what is the where where the label should come from or where the value should come from so in our case we just have continent so we just need to provide continent here okay and then click on apply okay that's it now uh, this filter is ready and it is uh, preparing for the search now we can click here and now we can see we have all the continents 
Now, however, if you notice in my original dashboards which I shown you, we had something called all. Okay, so in order to add option of all, you need to just uh, again click on this pencil and edit it. And now here you have some static options. Okay, so in static options, you can say all or whatever if you want to write overall or total, whatever you can write it here. And in the value, you can write star. Okay, so that's it. Now we are good to go. And now if we just uh, click here on this drop down, we can see we have option of all and also we have all the individual continent names. Uh, now I'm just going to click on save and for now if you notice you, even if I make any selection nothing is happening in any of these uh, dashboards. The reason for that is because we are not using this, uh, this token anywhere. Okay, So we need to start using these tokens. So if you remember here we have given this drop down a name, okay, a token name which is called continent filter. Now we need to use this continent filter in our search queries. Okay, so for example, uh, we can click here and edit the search for this one. So I'm going to click on edit search. Now here in the top, we need to add continent and in the continent, we need to use the token name. Okay, so continent equal to and we need to use these quotes because our continent has spaces also in the values. So that's why we are going to keep everything in quotation and we need to provide the name of the token which is continent filter and we need to surround this token name with dollar symbol. Okay, so this is how it is going to be. And now you can click on apply and now you will notice this value is going to change based on whatever value you select here. So we need to do the same for this table as well. So it's going to be continent and here we need to provide this value okay or this token name and that's it now it's good to go now we can click on save and we have our dashboard ready which is going to give us data based on whatever the selection which you make here so for example i'm going to select asia and now you can see that whatever uh, the summarization which we have or whatever the table data which we have it is going to give us or it is going to show us data only for uh, asian continent Okay, so now you can see we have India, Pakistan, Turkey and uh, I don't know what happened. It just we cannot see that uh, drop down anymore. So I'm just going to click on refresh. Okay, so everything is good now. Now you can see we have uh, we have Asia selected here in the drop down and now these results are going to change based on whatever selection which we have made here. And my search query is running a bit slow. The reason for that is because we have so many number of tweets which uh, Splunk has to handle and analyze. And also the disk which I'm using is not SSD. So that's why it's a bit slower. Okay, hopefully you understood how to create filters. Now in next video, we are going to learn how we can create nested filters. Do you have any query, please feel free to write in the comment box. So previous video I shown you how we can create a drop down filter and you can filter on any of the available options. Now uh, let's say you want to create a multi select filter. So you don't want to filter only on one continent. You want to filter on multiple continents. So in that case how, what you need to do. So I'll be showing you that in this video. So click on edit in order to edit this dashboard. And then we are going to remove this filter. Okay so I no longer need this filter. I'm just going to delete it and this is is now gone and now we can click on add input and we are going to select multi select okay so this is the input which we have uh, taken and now we need to have our search query as well so this is the search query i have so if i write this search query it is going to give me list of all the available continents okay so i'm just going to copy this con uh, this search query and now we can click here on edit input and now in the label field, I'm going to call it select continent or continents. Okay, so a person can select either a single continent or he will have option of selecting multiple continents. Okay, and now in the token, we are going to call it a continent. And then we can just scroll down. And here in the search string, we can put the search string which we have. 
and also in last 24 hours I need to change it to all time and in the label you need to provide which is the field which you want to be shown as a label so I want to show continent and also for value also I want to show continent okay so I'm just going to use continent continent here as well now click on apply and you will notice this is going to show you all the available uh, continents okay now I can select uh, different values here okay now you will notice here when you select multiple options uh, this search query is actually uh, going to fail okay that is what I'm expecting and I'll also then going to show you what is the reason it has failed and how you can create a proper multi select query okay so just notice here it is showing you total tweets zero and also here also it is not able to show any data now the reason for that is if you just uh, click here on uh, edit search okay or rather we should not be doing edit search just save it okay I want to show you what is the search query which has been formed so uh, we saved it and now here if you just uh, click on open in search you will notice here the value which which is coming there in the search okay so actually whenever you select the dynamic drop down it forms a runtime search query okay so this is the search query which is coming here now what you see here is it is showing as North America and Europe okay so you have selected North America and Europe and that is why in the continent it is coming as North America and Europe okay so obviously you know in your search query uh, this is not which you were intending rather what what you were intending is that you wanted to build it uh, something like this okay so it is going to be North America or it should be Europe okay and now if I uh, click on search okay so now we notice that it is giving us proper result okay now it is showing us total tweets so uh, that's why you notice when we built this I was expecting this to fail and it has failed so now uh, let's click on edit and let's uh, make it or let's fix this okay so notice here when you click on edit input in, in multi select you get loss of uh, different options okay so there is something called uh, we should be actually focusing on here which is called all right yeah delimiter okay so this is what we actually need to focus on so what we want is when we select one value and when we select second value there should be some delimiter to be used between one value to another okay and the delimiter which we want to be used is going to be okay I'm just going to delete it then the delimiter should be or okay so I'm going to call it or and also we need a space okay so now what uh, what is going to happen is whenever we select one value after that it is going uh, going to place or and space and then it is going to place the second value okay now in this case also you will notice that when we select these values let's see what happens okay I just want to show it to you and also notice one thing uh, in the preview you can see how it is going to place one value to another so you notice it is going to place value 1 and then there is no space okay so we have or and then we have a space after or but we don't have any space before or okay so if we run this search query like this okay without any space between or and let's see what happens I'm not really sure if it is going to run fine okay so it runs fine so which means uh, it is okay in this case but the reason it is okay is because we have used quotes okay so let's say if I do not use quotes and in that case this or is not going to be treated as a logical operator okay and in that case it is going to fail so in our scenario if you notice it is showing value 1 or value 2 so this is actually going to fail so one thing which you can do is uh, make sure you add one space in the beginning as well okay so now this is looking uh, prettier so we have value 1 then we have space or space value 2 okay now these values are going to be this value 1 and value 2 which you see this is going to be, get replaced with the actual values which you select from this uh, continent filter 
now one more thing which i need to do here is uh, you see this token value prefix and token value suffix okay so in the token value prefix and suffix let's add quote okay so i want a quotation here and also i want a quotation in the suffix okay so because you if you notice here we have spaces in the value of continents okay so i have north america but i have a space in between so if i don't put quotes here okay let's say if i don't put quotes here then this search query is not going to run the way you are intending okay let's say if i click here on the search and it's not really going to run and it's not going to give you the result which you are expecting as you can see here it is just giving us total tweets zero because this america and europe is just not getting interpreted or evaluated the way you are intending so the best thing is whenever you have uh, uh, spaces between strings you should be quoting them okay so this is that's the reason why we are using token value of quote and token value of uh, quote in both prefix and suffix okay and in the delimiter notice we have or and this is now looking perfect i have clicked on apply and i'm just going to click on save and i'm just going to remove it and we will apply this again okay so now let's select europe let's select asia and let's see how it works okay so it is still searching and it is going to searching for the result let's see how it works and still in the total tweets it is saying zero so i'm just going to click here on open in search again and let's see what is the query which has been built this time so there might be something which we are missing okay so one thing which has happened is in the continents it is actually using double quotes now the reason why it is happening is that in our token as well so for example i'm just going to click on edit here and also if you remember in our edit search we are using these uh, quotes okay so i'm going to remove these quotes because in our uh, prefix and suffix also we have added quotes so we no longer need quotes here so i'm just going to click on apply and we need to do the same for here as well so we need to remove these quotes and click on apply and now you will notice that this is giving you the result uh, which you were expecting okay so it is showing us that uh, from continent europe and asia there were this many tweets which has been done in total and it is also showing us that top 10 countries from europe or asian uh, continent okay so i hope uh, this multi select option or multi select filter made sense for you the reason i did not go a straight way and i shown you you know in a bit more detail is because uh, what i think is that uh, this multi select is a bit tricky most of the times you add or you create a filter with multi select when you don't have any spaces and later on when the data changes when there are a data which is having space gets added in your filter you will see your search query is going to break that's the reason i just wanted to explain these things to you in more detail okay uh, so hopefully you liked it and if you liked it uh, do like the video as well and write to me in the comment section and if for some reason this did not work for you or you want more inputs uh, just let me know in the comment section and i'll be more than happy to help you So in my previous video I shown you how we can uh, create drop down filters in Splunk. So we have created a filter on continent so you can select one of these continents and then this data gets changed based on whichever continent you select and it shows you all the tweets uh, which is done for US elections only in that continent. Okay? So now in this case I'm going to create another dashboard or probably we can just edit this dashboard and we are going to add one more filter and in that filter we should be able to filter out any selected countries okay so first level filter is going to be uh, continent level and then we want to see list of all the countries which belongs to only the selected country okay 
so probably it will be more clearer when I show it to you. So one thing which we need here is we need an input of drop down and we need to add countries search query in there. Okay, so let's first build the search query. So I already have this search query ready. Okay, so if I just select or if I just run this search query, it gives me list of all the countries. Okay, so this gives me list of all the countries from all the continents. Okay, because you can see here in the continent, I have selected continent equal to star. Now, uh, what we want is that uh, whenever we select any one of these continents, that continent value should be coming here. Okay, in in uh, in terms of wherever we have star, that continent value should be coming. So, for example, let's say if I place Asia here in this rather than star, then you will notice that it is going to now give me list of all the countries, but it is going to give list of all the countries only from Asian continent. Okay, so this is what exactly which we are looking for. So initially, uh, probably I'm just going to keep it to star and I'm going to copy this search query. Okay, so I have copied this search query and now we can uh, edit this dashboard and we are going to add one input uh, of drop down type. And here we are going to click on edit input and give it a label. So I'm going to call it uh, select country. And then in the token, uh, you can provide the name of the token. So let's call it country filter. And then just scroll down in the search string, we need to uh, put our search query. And also here in the last 24 hours, I need to change it to all time to get the list of all the countries. Now in the field for label, you need to provide whichever field you want to show in the label. So I want to show this field, which is called country. So I'm just going to type here country. And also in the field for value also, I just want to provide the name of country. Okay, so we need to give a country in the field for value as well. Now, so far, everything is quite good. I can just click on apply. And now you will notice this, this is populating the values and the values which is it it is going to show here is going to be list of all the countries okay now this is not exactly what we are looking for we want to see list of all the countries but we want to see list of all the countries which belongs to the selected continent okay so here i can see uh, united states germany and other countries which doesn't really belong to uh, asian continent okay so what it means is that uh, now we need to click here or just click on edit input of this uh, continent drop down and you need to use this token. Okay, so I'm going to use this continent token and we need to use it here in the search query. So remember in the search query, we have built a query which is uh, filtering the data based on whatever continent which we provide. So by default, we have given it a value of star. Now we don't want star here, we want it to be changing with a uh, continent token okay so now what it uh, what is going to happen is whichever uh, continent which is select here that value is going to get replaced here okay so our query will look something like something like which you see here when i put asia or united states okay so this is uh, what is the dynamic query going to be now click on apply and now uh, it's still populating okay so or if you want, we let's let's choose uh, this time. Let's choose uh, Europe, and then you will notice here in the countries, you should be able to see list of all the countries which uh, belongs to Europe continent. Okay, so now you can see we only see the countries which belongs to Europe continent. So if I select Asia this time you are going to notice we do not see any countries which belongs uh, which do not belong to asia okay so this is what we were looking for in the in the filters now notice one thing uh, in the in this below dashboards or tables which we have we have not added these filters okay so here you can see in the list of countries we see only the list of countries which is uh, from Asian continent. Okay, so so far everything is pretty good. Now just notice here if I just click here on the edit search of uh, this total tweets. Now you can notice we have a filter on continent, 
but we do not have any filter on country okay so which means we should also add filter of country so i'm going to say country equal to and quote and we need to give dollar continent underscore filter okay remember this is a name which we have uh, given to uh, this country filter okay country token so if i click on apply i'm sorry i think it was country filter country underscore filter we'll double check it again in the token okay so it is country filter i'm clicking on apply and let's click here on and yeah the token name was country filter so that should be fine now you can click on uh, now you see it is saying that it is waiting for input now you need to select one of the countries so it can show you the data so let's uh, select India and now uh, this is going to show you all the tweets which has been done from India okay for US elections now again you need to make uh, similar changes here as well so in this case I want to show states I'm no longer interested in the countries because I already have country in the filter so I'm going to change this a bit and going to say top 10 state and here we have filter on continent and we need to add another filter on country okay so whatever token name which you have given you need to put that token name here click on apply and now you will notice that it is going to show you all the states which belong to uh, your selected country so I have selected India so it is showing me all the states from India okay so this is how easy it is to create a nested filters now twice is your so in this session I'm going to show you how we can create drill down reports in Splunk so by drill down what I mean is let's say we have a pie chart here and you can see that in this pie chart we have three sorts of value we have error we have info and we have warning type of value and if you hover over uh, to these values you can see what is the count of those and what is the percentage contribution of these values now let's say if I click here on warning I want this uh, data to be changing and showing me detail about only warning uh, type of events okay so let's see if I click on here on warning you are seeing that this table here is changing and it is showing me all the events of warning level okay and if I click on error it is changing again it is going to show me all the events of error level okay so in order to do this uh, drill downing we need to make uh, two different search queries so one is going to be for this one and the other one is going to be for this table so let's click on search and start building search query so first I'm going to build a search query for this one uh, building search query for this is pretty straightforward so all we have to do is we have to summarize the data so for that we are going to use a stats command so here I'm going to say index equal to main and stats and we want to count all the different type of events okay so if I just do like this it is going to show me all the uh, data joined together it is not going to break it down based on error info or warning and in order to do that I need to do I need to say by LVL okay so we want to break it down by level so this is what uh, the data which we have and also I want to change this I want to change this label to some other so we need to say here as and let's say we want to call it error type okay so now you can see this is exactly is uh, what we were looking for however we don't want this data in a tabular format we want it in a pie chart so you can click here on visualization and Splunk is going to suggest some visualization for you uh, if by default it is not suggesting you pie chart then you can click here and you can select pie chart or probably if you want a bar chart you can click on bar chart okay so the choice is yours in this case I just want to go ahead with pie chart and now you can save it in a dashboard so you can click on save as click on dashboard panel and then save it in a dashboard panel so I'm gonna call it uh, Splunk drill down demo okay so this seems okay click on save 
and if you click here on view dashboard now you are going to be taken to this URL so now this URL is dedicated only for this dashboard so whenever you need to come to this dashboard you can just uh, open this URL that's one way so for example if I just open this uh, URL here I can directly go to this dashboard or the other way is uh, you can just click here on dashboard so if you click on dashboards you are going to see list of all the available dashboards so you can see here these are all the dashboards which I have created so you can click on the dashboard which you have created and then you are going to see that okay so so far everything is uh, pretty straightforward and simple now we are going to build second query which is going to show a table so for that again I'm going to click on search uh, let's close all the other tabs and focus only on search and in this case now you will notice uh, our query is going to be slightly different and basically we are going to filter the data so it's going to be index equal to main and I'm going to say level equal to info okay so basically I'm filtering the data I want to see only info level of data now you can see there are many events and many fields available so in this out of these uh, I'm just going to create a table and I want to use time and message and let's say we also want to use a level after time so okay if you want any additional fields you can do that for example let's say if you are interested in uh, addresses so you can use this as well but in this case I'm not going to use it so just click here on search and you will see that you are going to see the data in a tabular format and you are going to see all the data related only to info event type okay so this is something which we were looking for now you will notice here if I change this value from info to warn then this data is going to change and going to show us event only for warning types so uh, I guess by now you would have already understood what is the fundamentals behind this so we want to change this value dynamically based on the you know based on this uh, whatever uh, type which we select on okay so let's save this dashboard as well and this time we are not going to uh, create a new dashboard we are going to click on existing and we are going to select the dashboard which we have previously created which was Splunk drill down demo and if you want to give a name to this panel you can provide that otherwise you can just click on save so I'm just going to click on save click on view dashboard and you will notice here the URL remains the same so it is just going to add that additional panel in the previously created dashboard so now we have two uh, panels we have this nice pie chart which is giving us summary data and then we have this tabular view so right now if I click here on warning or if I click here on any of these uh, info or error nothing happens okay so this value is not changing now in order to make it interactive we are going to click here on edit and we need to make some changes here in this uh, in this pie chart okay so I'm going to click here on more action click on edit drill down and then on the on click you need to add manage tokens and here you are going to create a variable okay and that variable is going to have one of the available error level names okay so that variable is go uh, going to get auto assigned some value which is going to be either info error or warning and this variable name we are going to use in our ta uh, table as well okay so this variable let's say I'm going to call it error type so you can name it whatever uh, variable name you want to name it and in the token value if you just click here on token value it is going to suggest you all the available token value so out of these you can just read about uh, all of these and the description is pretty straightforward so in this case we need to select click value and then you can click on apply okay so now this dashboard or this panel is having a token okay and that token we want to use in this search okay so if you click here on edit search of this table then what you need to do is you need to now replace this this value with the token value of previous panel so if you don't remember what was the value or token value of this panel then you can again click here on more actions click on edit drill down and this is a you know token name which we have created so you can copy it and then you need to refer to this token value in this search and you need to remove this warning and you want to assign the token name here 
okay so if you just do like this it's probably not going to work the way you intended it because all the token value should be or token names should be referred by dollar dollar okay so we need to add a dollar here and in the beginning and also in the end as well now click on apply and now if you see it is saying search is waiting for input so you need to make a selection here so if i select on info you will notice here this value is changing okay so you can click on save and you can save it and now you can just click on error and you will notice that this value here is going to change okay so uh, this is how you can create a uh, drill down reports in splunk and if you have any query or probably something didn't work out for you please write in the comment section and i'll try to uh, provide the solution to you so thanks for watching Hello everyone, I hope you all are doing great. In today's session, I'm gonna show you how we can use case statement and lookup in uh, Splunk. And also I'm going to share you uh, in which scenario we should be using case statements and in which scenario we should be using lookups. So first of all, the data which I have is the data which I have downloaded from uh, Splunk. Okay, so this is the data uh, which I got from this link. Uh, you don't really need to remember this link. Just go to Google and search for tutorial Splunk tutorial data. Okay, after that you will be coming to this link. Click on uh, this link to start downloading. Once you download, there is instruction given here that how you can upload the data to Splunk okay so once you upload the data you are going to have uh, this kind of data which is basically transactional data and it is telling you uh, the data which we are interested in basically which tells us whether the transaction is a success transaction or whether it is a failure so yeah this is a field which you can see here status field this is where we, uh, this is a field in which we are interested in okay so this status field field is basically uh, HTTP response codes so as you know http response of 200 means everything was okay transaction was successful and uh, for 503 it may mean something else and so on okay so if you want to know what are these responses and what are the meaning of these responses then you can go to again you can google it just write http response codes and what i did was actually i i uh, searched with http response code name with csv and then i got this uh, csv yeah i got this uh, you know nice csv which was having mapping of all the all the codes and their corresponding names okay so you know that okay 200 means it is okay and uh, 404 is i think quite common which everyone knows 404 means uh, page not found okay and so on uh, so it's very difficult to remember all of these but yeah uh, that's why i would just search for the list of you know uh, http response code and their actual meaning and i got this one which is very useful now what we want is uh, let's say we want to create a report in which we want to show how many of them were successful and how many of them were not successful okay so how many transactions uh, so it's more like a success versus failure kind of you know uh, trend line so for that what i'm going to do is uh, we can use stats and we can also use count and by status okay since we are interested in status now you will notice one thing that uh, when we are doing status count by state uh, stats count by status it's going to give us a list of all the status okay so uh, first thing which we want is for 200 you know for status cost code 200 we want to show okay and for all others we want to show not okay okay so this is the kind of scenario where you can use a case statement so in this case we need to use a case statement and we are going to say uh, eval uh, you can write status if you want to uh, overwrite the same field or if you want to change the field or uh, you can call it description equal to case and inside case the syntax is that first you need to do a comparison and then you need to provide the value so uh, we are going to say if status is equal to uh, 200 then we calling it okay and then we are going to do another comparison so we are going to say uh, status I'm sorry I think I just made a mistake in in here so just gonna change it to status and then okay so here again we are going to say if status equal to so basically we just want to say okay and not okay so in this case we are going to say status equal to 200 is okay 
and for any other status it should be just not okay so in that case you can write some uh, condition which is always going to be true so for example i can say one equal to one uh, then write not okay okay so in this case what is happening is all of these conditions are actually evaluated in the same order in which we define here so first uh, it's going to be field by field so it is going to check whether status is equal to 200 and it's going to say yes it is a uh, condition is matching so in that case it is going to uh, uh, update description field with okay and then it's not going to check second condition because first condition has already met so now it's going to move on to record second or row number second and then it is going to check whether status is equal to 200 which is false because status is equal to 400 in second row then in that case it's just going to go to second uh, comparison and it is going to say one equal to one yeah which means it is true and then it is going to uh, write not okay in description field okay so that is how it works and uh, i'm just going to remove stats and we are going to say table because we just want to first see the data okay so we can uh, yeah let's see the data i'm gonna say table and going to say status description and also we can write yeah i think the, this, these are the two which we want to write and let's see what is the data which you get okay so as you can see here for anywhere uh, where the data is 200 it, it has created a new field which is called description and written okay and for everything else it has written not okay uh, so now we can use description field for status or sorry stats and we can call it uh, stats count of uh, count by description okay and let's run it and this time it's going to show us how many of them were okay and how many of them were not okay uh, so that's one way of you know uh, knowing uh, the transaction you know whether it was successful or unsuccessful now let's say if similar thing you want to do over a trend line chart then you can do that as well in that case you need to change it and you know to use a uh, timeline and then you're gonna say count in this case so it is going to be like this so timeline i'm sorry it's going to be time chart not timeline so time chart count of description by description and let's run it okay so this is the data which we have and we also want to change uh, it to you know visualization because we want to show a timeline chart okay so you can now see how many of them were okay and not okay and it's showing you kind of comparison of okay versus not okay on uh, over a period of time okay so that's uh, quite good now let's assume that you don't just you are not just interested in okay versus not okay you want to see list of all the you know status which has happened over a period of time in that case it's going to be really time consuming because what you have to now do is you have to write all the conditions here so for example here we have written if status is equal to 200 then it is okay and then we have to write if status is equal to 400 then it's going to be page not found okay and so on basically for all the error codes which we have we have to write this condition and run it and then it is going to you know show us uh, basically gonna give us stats of all the conditions which has happened over a period of time okay so here you can see we have not okay we have okay we have page not found uh, but if I just change this data slightly or let's say if uh, I run stats again by status you will notice here we have quite a lot of status okay so we have um, i guess on an average i guess we had around yeah nine stats okay so we have nine status here and it's going to be very difficult for you to write you know all of these status conditions here uh, and uh, by the way once a new data comes in future again you have to make sure that uh, you have to modify this search query every time okay so in these kind of situation or or scenarios it is better that you use lookups rather than you know using a case statement so for example um, what we can do is we can have a csv file which is you know something which is going to be something like this uh, in fact in this case uh, i am going to download the same csv file so for that all you have to do is go to raw or right click and then save it 
and save it as a csv okay and now in this csv if you see what we have is we have a code we have a column name which is called code which is having list of all the response codes and then we have a column which is called description and name okay so uh, we are interested in actually a description or probably we can just go ahead with a name it doesn't really matter uh, because I think both of them are giving uh, something similar which we can uh, use so in this case uh, what you can do is you can download the CSV file and use it as a lookup uh, I'm not going to go into more detail of you know what are the types of lookups available in Splunk uh, we can probably do that later but in this scenario what we can do is uh, we can go to settings and then we can upload a lookup file so you can click on lookups and here you need to upload a CSV file which is having list of you know uh, which is having basically description for all of these uh, codes all of these status codes so let me first show you what is the you know I have already downloaded the file which is HTTP response code and I'm just gonna open this file and uh, you can see here this is a file which I have and what I have done is uh, I have made sure that this you know this code column is called status if you if this column is not called status you can do that in Splunk as well you can handle it in Splunk not a problem but uh, just to simplify it I change this uh, column name to status okay so as you can see here on the portal here the column was called code uh, this is the only uh, change which I have made here in this file okay that's all and uh, remaining every, this file is going to be same I'm just going to close it and now let's go to lookup and upload this lookup file so let's click on lookup table files and in fact I already had a lookup with the same name so first I'm going to remove it so this is a lookup file let me just go ahead and remove this lookup file and then we are going to add this lookup file again now I'm gonna click here on new lookup table file click here and then it is going to ask you to you know, upload the lookup file you can also okay so here I'm gonna choose click on choose file and then let's select the CSV file which you want to upload so this is the CSV lookup file which I want to upload so click on upload and here I can you know give it any name so I'm gonna call it HTTP response codes dot CSV okay so this is uh, the name which I'm gonna uh, call it with this is important because we are going to refer to the same name when uh, we are using it in the query so click on save and one more thing to remember here is which is very important uh, since you have created this lookup by default you are going to have the permission to it but if you are uh, creating a dashboard based on this lookup then you need to make sure that you have given the permission uh, for everyone to use it for example uh, I'm just gonna show you here so in this case as you can see by default it doesn't have any permission okay so you need to make sure you uh, change it to either this app only if you just want you know only for search app to have the access of this lookup file if you want this uh, lookup file uh, to be accessed by all the applications so you need to make sure you select here all application and in this case again you can select for which role you want to give read or write access so in this case I'm just gonna give read access to everyone I'm not gonna give write access to anyone okay so once this is done now we can go uh, go ahead and click here on uh, you know search and reporting again and then we can start uh, playing around with this data so I'm gonna show you how you know we can simplify our search which we had done in in uh, which we had done previously and how we are you know with the help of this lookup file we are going to quickly build the query so first of all if you want to see the data of this lookup file all you have to do is you have to write input lookup and you have to give the name of the CSV file so in this case I already had written this query so we can see this is coming in the suggestion so this is the query which we need to write now click here on a search and also if you want you can you may change this to all time okay because it's a lookup file uh, so now you can see here we have description we have name we have status okay so these are the fields which we needed and we can see that uh, Splunk is able to properly read our CSV file and able to show us the data now what we are going to do is we are uh, gonna link uh, you know status which is available in our you know previous data and going to uh, compare that status with this status and wherever there is a match we are going to use uh, this field okay so we are going to use a uh, description field in that case if you want you can use name name field as well so it's up to you 
so the syntax is going to be you know little bit different so in this case we have to use a join statement okay so what we need to do is um, so here you know first line is uh, going to be the same we are saying index main source we are uh, telling us where is our you know source of data so it's going to give us all the transactional data which we saw in previous case and then we are saying whatever you get join uh, you know join status column with you know this uh, this query okay so what is happening here is uh, we don't really need this i'm just going to take it out okay so if you remember we have already tested input lookup http response code.csv and it gives us list of you know, it gives this data basically status name and description so what it is doing going to do is it is going to join you know data which is available in transaction you know events and it is going to join that with this lookup and then going to give us the final output so in this case uh, let's say what we are interested in is going to be called uh, status or let's do stats of status and yeah let's first do this and see how it works I'm sorry uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's just going to be actually count by status okay so now you can see we still have you know uh, exactly the same data which we had in previous query so what we ne now need to uh, do is we don't need to use a status field we can rather than status we can e either use name or we can use description field which is going to uh, give us more meaningful uh, na uh, description of these status so i'm just gonna change it to description click here on search again and in this scenario you can see we are going to have uh, meaningful data and we don't need to write case statements okay so here you can see we have uh, we can see that how many of them were okay how many of them were uh, bad requests forbidden and so on a search is still going on as you can see here in the progress bar that's the reason we have you know data is changing here uh, and also if you don't want uh, stats if you just want to see you know uh, what which is the uh, which is the kind of request which has happened more frequently so in that case you can probably use top command and something like this top description in that case or uh, in this case is going to show you um, all the top events uh, first and basically data is in descending order and also it is going to show you so as you can see here we can say that 86% uh, of the transactions were okay which means it was successful and on you know remaining 14 percent we had one or the other code and also if you want to use timeline on this data then you can do that as well again you can change it to time chart and you can have count of description by description and you can change it change the visualization you can select line chart okay so here you can see you have uh, you have data showing over a trend a time chart for all the different type of transaction and now in future let's say if you know new data comes for which we don't have you know description available right now in that case all you need to do is uh, you just need to uh, change the mapping in the lookup file okay so i guess your lookup file is already going to have a description for all the codes but let's say for uh, some code if the description is not there then you can go to that csv file in the lookup and you can you know you can go to lookup you can modify the file and then in that case this dashboard is going to get up updated automatically okay so that's all in this video see you again in the next video hello everyone i hope you all are doing great in today's video we are going to sh talk about how we can create lookups using splunk search queries so in previous videos i have shown you how we can create uh, lookups by going to settings and then going to lookups and then creating a lookup file now here we are not going to go to that option what we are going to rather do is we are going to use this search query and whatever the results which have come we want to you know keep it in a lookup file so first thing i'm just going to go to uh, settings and going to go to lookups and going to show you what are the lookups which are already available so when i create a new lookup you already know that it exists or it doesn't exist okay so uh, i'm just going to setting lookup table files and from here we can see list of all the lookups so right now we have uh, these many lookups 
and now what we will do is you can see this is the query which i am running and what it is giving me it is giving me list of all the log files which is being monitored by uh, splunk okay so now let's say i want to keep these uh, log files in a lookup file okay and then uh, that lookup file will be used by many uh, people for many different dashboards okay so that can be one of the scenarios now why you want to do something like this is uh, there can be many reasons to do that so i'm not going to go into more detail of that but one reason can be that you want to process the data once and then you want to you know keep that either keep the process data in a lookup file rather than everyone going and running the same uh, query which is going to you know uh, going to run over many events and then going to process the data so for example here you can see that you know the data which it has given is only uh, some uh, 11 items and for that it has to process 175000 uh, plus events now once uh, anyone else is going to run this query in that case again it has to you know go through all these number of events to get this data so rather than that what we can do is we can uh, process this data and keep this data in a lookup file okay so now in order to add this data to a lookup file all we need to do is we need to use command output lookup and after this command you need to specify the name of the lookup file and then the lookup file is going to get created under the same application which uh, under which you are using this search option so here we are using a search and reporting application so our lookup file is also going to get created under search and reporting so now uh, i'm going to give it a name of let's call it uh, log files monitored by splunk okay dot csv so make sure it ends with dot csv and that's it now if i run this it is going to create this lookup file and going to you know we can then be able to see that lookup file here okay so it has processed successfully no issues now we can go here now let's refresh this and we should be able to see the new lookup file which we just created okay now you can see that new lookup file has already come here and also you can see that it has been created in search application okay so if you have uh, ran this query under itsi application then you would have seen this lookup under itsi application uh, so that's it if you want to change the permission you can do that as well now one thing you can notice here by default if you are uh, creating a lookup file using uh, splunk searches then it is going to show here as no owner in the permission also if you want you can change the permission or by default is already has read permission for everyone so that is fine and now what we can do here is uh, now we can just go to you know search and create a new search query and also we can uh, we can uh, read the data from that lookup file to make sure that we have all the data uh, written in that lookup file so the search query is going to be input lookup and here we need to give a name of the lookup file so name of the lookup file is this so i'm going to give this dot csv hit enter and now you can see all the data which is available in the lookup file okay so this time it just has to you know process 11 events because that's the all events which are available in that csv file so now uh, other people can use this csv file to see list of all the applications or log files which is being monitored by splunk and again it can be used in many different ways by them okay now uh, you may want to automate this process of you know uh, finding a new log file and adding it in this uh, adding this in this lookup file for that all you have to do is you can save this as a report and let's call it let's call it report.csv okay so uh, log files monitored by splunk reports.csv then click on save and then you can go ahead and click on schedule and then schedule this so whenever it is going to run it is going to basically update the lookup file and also notice one thing uh, okay let me first show you how you can schedule it just click on schedule report and then you can run it once every day or whatever based on you know whatever uh, whatever scheduling demand which you have so in this case we can just say run every day at zero zero click on save and now it uh, this has been saved and it is going to run uh, once in 24 hours okay so this is fine and the other thing which we can uh, do is we can click again here on open in search and now i'm going to show you how you can append more data to that lookup file 
so right now what is happening is every time this search query is going to run and then it is going to create a new file okay basically it is going to overwrite this file and uh, then going to add this new data now uh, let's say you just want to append a new row of data in the existing file so how you can uh, achieve that so for that it is very simple all you have to do is you have to uh, specify here append equal to true okay so once you do append equal to true it is going to append the data in this csv file okay so in this case if i run this of course i'm going to get duplicate data in this csv file so for example i'm running it and now it is going to add this data again in the csv file so here if i run this input lookup and this uh, lookup file then you can see this time we are going to have more number of entries in this file okay, so you can see we have uh, 22 entries because data was already existing and then we added the same data again so you want to make sure that you don't uh, add duplicate data in this lookup file and for that again you can use some you know some sort of query or some sort of uh, lookup to make sure that you only end up adding new data in that file okay so uh, i'm not going to discuss about how we can do that uh, how we can append only you know a new data in the csv file probably we'll keep that for next video and for this video if you have any doubt uh, go ahead write in the comment section i'll be more than happy to answer so that's in uh, that's it in this video see you again in the next video hello everyone i hope you all are doing great in today's video i'm going to show you how we can create a kind of you know comparison trend line in which you want to compare today's traffic data with yesterday's data or you may want to compare today's data with any of the previous days data which can be uh, seven days ago old data or maybe any any data of your choice okay so uh, we are going to go in detail of how we can create this kind of data as you can see here on the screen i have today's data and which is being compared with yesterday's data and seven days ago data so uh, quickly we can you know see that seven days ago we had almost zero traffic and today and yesterday we have almost you know similar uh, sort of pattern of traffic so uh, this kind of uh, trend line can be very useful to quickly understand what is the flow like or whether there is any issue because if you see if if you are expecting the traffic to be same for today yesterday and day uh, minus seven and then suddenly you see the, the the traffic is not matching then it means there is some issue which is going on and this kind of trend line can help you uh, point out to that issue now i'm going to show you how we can create uh, this kind of data in detail but let's try to first understand uh, this graph okay or let's uh, let's try to see what is the data which you have so uh, right now the data which i have is kind of uh, traffic data okay of all the web uh, service request which has been made so if i just run this command you can see we have almost like we have quite a lot of event to be honest we have like 200,000 uh, plus events and we are just going to uh, do a count of all of these event and so for that uh, as i've already shown you in my previous tutorial for that we can just quickly use time chart and we can also define a span of let's say uh, one day and then we can also do a count okay so if i hit enter now and if i change it to visualization we should be able to do we should be able to you know visualize a daily trend line chart which is going to uh, show us data something like this okay so i have data starting from almost from 31st march which is going up to 25th of april which is as of today and this is the trend line okay this is a, a kind of you know day wise a trend line but we don't want to you know, do this kind of uh, analysis in this case we want to compare today's data with yesterday data and so on okay now before we move forward uh, one thing which i would like to let you know whenever you do this kind of comparison there are two types of uh, time which you need to you know 
uh, make sure that uh, which is the time you want to choose from whether you want to deal with relative time frame or you want to deal with fixed time frame for example when you want to compare today's data with yesterday data and in that case if from here if you select last 24 hours then in that case it is going to be a relative time frame so if you select last 24 hours in that case it is going to give you whatever the hour which is going on from that hour to last 24 hours so it's not going to be starting from 00, zero. okay not going to be starting uh, exactly from midnight so that's the reason in that case what we can do is uh, we can specify earliest and latest as you can see here in this case i'm just going to use earliest and latest which is going to uh, tell it to you know start earliest uh, from 10 days ago and keep today's data okay so if i run the same thing again uh, one thing is it is going to limit the data and it is going to show the data only from last 10 days and it is also going to you know show us the data based on not based on relative time but based on you know fixed days time uh, it's gonna make more sense when we move on to our day wise comparison so now we are gonna use a different command which is called time uh, wrap okay so the syntax of time wrap is pretty straightforward uh, you use d2 if you want to uh, do a day wise uh, trend line comparison you can use w if you want to do a week wise comparison so in this case i'm just gonna use d for day wise comparison and you can uh, so I'm just gonna uh, first just gonna show you until this point of time and let's see what is the data which we get and then I'm gonna show you uh, some more detail about it okay so this is the kind of you know uh, comparison which we have as of now as you can see since we have done you know day wise comparison and our uh, time chart span is also day wise that's the reason you say uh, see only one data point for every day okay so this is not typically which we want when we are doing day wise comparison we want to uh, probably analyze the data for each hour so in that case i'm going to change it to one edge which is going to be referring to hour and hit enter again and let's see what is the data which we have now okay now you can see we have data something like this so we have latest day which is today's uh, data and then we have one day before we have two days before three days before and so on okay so uh, if you know time wrap command is now what it is doing is it is uh, it is basically calculating every day's data and also you can see since we have put earliest and latest so the start of the day is happening from 12.00 am so i'm just gonna remove it for a moment and then just gonna run it to show you uh, what is the importance of specifying that date and time okay so here i'm just gonna run it like this and now you can see since it is starting from a relative time so it's going to be you know showing us comparison of one day ago uh, depending on what is the time now so it is almost like uh, 10 pm so that's the reason it is going 24 hours you know behind from 10 pm for today's data and so on okay so it is starting from 10 pm uh, this is not really which we want when we are doing day wise comparison so i'm just going to uh, roll it back and going to give it earliest is equal to minus 10 day at the rate d and latest is equal to at the rate d okay so this is the data which we have now one thing which um, you can see here is that all the days is being post fixed by days underscore before okay so that's the name which is given automatically by time wrap and then there is a you can use series is equal to short so what it will do is it is going to change this you know column names and it's going to give a short name which is going to be s0 s1 s2 and so on so let's run it and let's see what is the difference which we are going to see okay so now you can see for we don't have today we have s0 which is uh, specifying today and then we have s1 s2 s3 s4 and so on okay so you can uh, depending on whatever your requirement is you can decide whether you want series is equal to short or you don't want it it's going to be useful when you want to do a pattern search or pattern filter or if you just want to don't want to deal with longer names in that case you can also use it now uh, let's say we want to compare uh, today's data with yesterday data which means we just want s0 and s1 so in that case you can uh, filter it by using fields and in fields we need three fields we need time uh, this is a time field so this is definitely which we need and then we need s0 and we need s1 okay and also uh, okay now let's run it and let's see what is the data which we are getting this time 
okay so this time we have only two fields which is s0 and s1 okay so it's doing a comparison of uh, today's data with yesterday's data so which is fine and what we can have as well is uh, for example if you let's say want to compare uh, s3 data as well uh, or s7 data you can specify that as well here so in this case i'm just going to keep uh, give s0 s1 and s7 Okay, so this is the data which we are getting in this case and also now uh, af after that if you want to you know, rename S0 to today then in that case you can just use rename command and I'm going to rename S0 as let's say we want to call it uh, today and S1 let's say we want to call it as yesterday and we want to for, to S7 we want to call it as seven days ago okay and let's run this search again and now you can see we have today yesterday and seven day ago data so this is how you can create a you know comparison between different days of data over a period of time and if you want uh, uh, to compare or you do a weekly compare so that is possible as well you just need to change time ref from d to w uh, let's quickly try to do it and see how it works so i'm just going to change it to w and also i'm going to remove all of these for now let's just run it and see how it works and probably also span we when we are comparing you know weekly data we don't really want a span of hour we are probably going to be interested in day a uh, day wise span so i'm just going to change it to day wise and then we are having you know a weekly comparison so s0 is uh, is basically this week's data and s1 is you know last week's data uh, one more thing if you notice here it is actually just you know giving us last uh, 10 days data so i'm going to change it to last 15 days so we have complete two weeks of data oh okay and yeah let's just make it 14 so we can have exactly two weeks of data because right now it was showing almost three weeks of data okay so s0 is our this week's data and s1 is you know last week's data so uh, that's how it's showing right now so again if you want you can rename s0 as uh, this week and you can also rename s1 to last week and then you can see this is a trend line which is which it is going to show you and uh, again uh, this kind of visualization is very useful when you want to do some sort of comparison over the time uh, so that's all uh, i had to show in this video if you have any question do feel free to write in the comment section if you have some sp uh, specific requirement for which you want me to create a video please let me know in the comment section i'm gonna be more than happy to explore that area and going to create a video for you so thank you so much for watching see you again in the next video so in one of my previous video I was discussing about joins in Splunk and in this video we are going to discuss about joins again but in more detail. So uh, in previous video I have just shown you how we can combine result of main search with sub search and I didn't really uh, go into more details about joins but in this video I'm going to do that. So if you just go to Splunk documentation and you read about joins what it tells is that join is going to uh, combine the result of sub searches with the result of main searches okay so uh, there are two types of searches which you perform you can perform so whatever you are uh, you are writing here is actually called a main search and any search which you write under these square brackets is called sub search okay so for example let's say if i uh, run something like this then it is going to be called a sub search okay so uh, by default sub search is going to have more priority so what happens is when you run a main search and a sub search and you join them then sub search is going to run first and then uh, its result is going to get combined with the main search so that is how join works now uh, when you run join there are uh, two types of options which are available which is called left join or inner join so by default when you do not spe uh, specify anything in join command then inner join runs okay or inner join actually gets uh, takes place 
or if you specify left join or outer join in that case uh, this is the scenario or this is the thing which is going to happen so uh, by this picture uh, what it means is then when you perform a left join in that case all the data between uh, all the data from main table is going to get returned and only the matching data from uh, the sub search is going to get returned or get, uh, going to be displayed or basically going to be uh, shown you as a result okay now here in the inner join what happens is that only the data which matches in main search and also in sub search is going to be shown so any data which doesn't uh, match in main search or sub search is not going to be shown okay so now let's try to understand this with an example so for example uh, let me just get rid of this so right now the data which i have is a transactional data about a website uh, which also returns response code of a website or transactions basically so in this case let's say i'm gonna say top status and it is going to give me count of all the status which has all the transactional status and going to show them by count and percentage okay so here we can see we have http response code or http status code of, of 200 and th these many transaction which has you know resulted in http uh, status code of 200 and this is a percentage of them and in one of my previous video i have also shown you that you know this is very difficult to understand status so we have linked it or we have joined this data with a lookup table okay so this is the lookup table which we used uh, which is called http response code dot csv so i'm going to use the same query again and for that what we need to do is uh, we need to write a sub search okay so for uh, to write a sub search it is very simple all you have to do is use square brackets and inside this you can write uh, input input lookup okay in in this case i'm using lookup uh, that's why i'm writing input lookup but you can uh, pretty much write any search query or any query or all the commands which are available in the main query is also available in the uh, sub search as well so you can write any query which you want now here i'm just gonna uh, write only this much okay this looks okay and now we need to run uh, we need to type join as well to join the commands or to join basically the result of sub search with the main search so uh, join is also a command so it means you also have to use pipe okay now let's run it and see what happens okay so now you can see what has happened is uh, this uh, lookup file it has returned description and name against each of the status code so status code of 200 means everything was okay transaction was okay and status code of 503 means service was unavailable and so on okay now uh, one thing if you notice here uh, I'm probably gonna create a new search and then let's run this again and so I can show you the difference between uh, the previous search when we didn't do any join and uh, this search when we did the join okay so let it load okay I'm just gonna run this query again okay no I'm not going to join anything I'm just going to run this and let me also use all time and one thing which i want you to notice is that you can see that in status or basically overall we have nine results and here if you see we have only eight results so what has happened is we if you see here in the status code one of the results are missing so the missing result is 404 okay so here you can see we have uh, 404 and here we do not have 404 okay now the reason for that is because our lookup table doesn't contain uh, any data related 404 definition okay so what it means is uh, right now inner join uh, is taking uh, effect and since a and b you know a actually contains a which is our main query it contains a status code of 404 However, our inner query, which is sub search, uh, doesn't contain definition or data regarding 404. That's the reason the final result, which you see here, doesn't contain 404. Okay, now let's say uh, in some cases you do want to show all the you know, results from your main search, regardless of whether the data or the corresponding data is available in the sub search or not. Okay, so in that case, you have to uh, use left join. Okay, so the syntax is very simple. After join, you need to specify type equal to left, and then you can run it again. And now we should be able to see total of nine results, and we are also going to see data for 404. 
okay so now you can see we have data for 404 however there is no description or name is available for 404 status code the reason being is that uh, this input lookup doesn't contain any data of 404 status code so i'm just going to run this input you know, input lookup code separately so i can show you that this doesn't contain data about 404 status code okay as you can see i'm running it here and now you can see here it has data until 403 if we go on next page also you can see we do not have data for 404 okay it starts from 405 uh, so that is how you know join works you have uh, two types of option either you can use inner join or left join and actually there is outer join as well but it is having same effect as left join so for example if i change it to outer it is going to give you the same output okay so i hope i clarified uh, what are the different types of joins which is available in splunk and in which scenario you want to use them and which scenario you do not want to use them okay so thank you so much for watching if you have any query feel free to write in the comment box see you again in the next video So in this session, I'm going to show you how you can quickly create beautiful graphs in Splunk. Now, this is the data I have. Okay, so I'm going to explore the data of Grafana log file. And the data which I have is having uh, several type of error levels. Okay, so I have info level, I have warning level, and I have error levels. Okay, so just to show you it in a tabular format, if I just do table and underscore time LVL, then you can see that this is the data which we have okay so on the left side you can see the time and you can see we have info if i go to next page you can probably see uh, some of them coming as error now if i scroll down you can see we have of uh, warning type okay so now let's see we want to uh, see how many of those are of info or error or warning type and we want to see it based on a time chart okay so uh, we want to see how is the trend every minute or every five minutes or so now to do that all we have to do is we are going to use a time chart command so we are going to use time chart and then we are going to count the levels and if i just hit enter now you can see that we are going to get some sort of data now uh, this data may not be uh, in the format which you want okay so one thing which we need to quickly fix here is you can see here it is showing as count of levels so we don't want uh, this column name to be shown here so uh, we are going to rename this column name as let's call it error type and hit enter so now you will see that this has started looking little better now we are going to click on visualization because what we want here is uh, we want uh, a trend line chart okay so now once you see once you click on visualization it is going to select the best possible uh, chart for you based on the data you have now it, just in case if you are interested on some different type of uh, graph then you can click on line chart here and here you have like uh, several other recommendation which you can choose for example i can choose bar graph okay so here i can see uh, for like based on the time frame what was the count of errors now uh, one thing you, to notice here is that it is giving us aggregation of all the error types so it is not able to segregate between info errors or warning or error right so to do that all we have to do is we need to break it down by using l level okay so we are breaking it down based on the level field now again i'm just going to change it to trend line because that's what looks bit better and now i'm going to click on search so we can see uh, how the data is going to look like now okay so now you can see we have error we have info and we have warning and this is the trend of all of these uh, all of these three types of you can say error okay and now one thing to notice here is if you just scroll uh, scroll a bit down now you can see the interval of this timing is every five minutes okay so we have data for 1255 then we have data for 13 then we have data for 1305 now what if you don't want to see data or you don't want to aggregate data based on every five minutes rather you want to aggregate data 
at interval of every 30 minutes okay so uh, that's pretty easy all you have to do is you just have to uh, type span equal to 30 minutes okay and then what it is going to do is it is going to uh, aggregate the data based on every 30 minutes so now you can see we have 12.30, then we have 1 p.m., then we have 1.30, and here is the data point here at 1.30, and then we have for 2 p.m., 2.30, and so on. Uh, of course, you can change it to hourly, and all you have to do is you just have to specify the number of hours. So in this case, if I want uh, based on every hour, I can do span equal to 1H, which is going to specify uh, that data we want to see aggregated on every hour. Okay, so this is how it's going to look like if it is on hourly basis. Now, uh, let's say we want to have, you know, dynamically, we want to create three different uh, graphs, okay, based on one for basically each of these types. So one for error, one for info, and one for warning type. So in that case, it's pretty straightforward. All you have to do is just click on trellis. And once you click on trellis, there is going to be use trellis layout. Select this and then from the aggregation you need to split it by level okay so you want to split it by LVL and now this is the trend line which you have okay so now you can see we have a separate uh, trend line for error and for type info and for warning and I'm just gonna uh, set it to 30 minutes again so we can see uh, more data here and also if you want to see like um, more duration of data you can just switch it to like last 24 hours or so uh, so that's another thing which you can do and one important thing which uh, I want to show you is for example let's say when you don't have data and in that case do you want to show that as zero or do you want to show that as uh, nothing or do you want to sh uh, probably show it as a just just as a dot okay so for example, if you see here for 1600, we have zero error, zero info, and zero warning. So what do you want to do in this case? Let's say if you don't want to see this complete record where you don't have any data, in that case, all you have to do is, uh, there is a field which is called count. Okay, so this is for continuity. So you can set it to false. Okay, so once you set it to false and you click on search, you will notice that all the records for all that uh, for the time where we don't have any value for error info or warning is going to get disappear okay so i'm going to click on search and now if we scroll down you can see all those data points are now you can see we have data only for the time when we have some data either in error or info or warning so where we had uh, no data absolutely no data in error info or warning those uh, those records have gone okay so again based on whatever requirement you have you can quickly create these visualizations now i can just save it as a dashboard so for that all i have to do is just click on save as and click on dashboard panel and then give it a name so i'm going to say uh, i'm just going to name it error trend line and that's all you can just click on save and your dashboard is ready you can click on view dashboard and once you click on view dashboard you are going to be taken to that dashboard and this is how that dashboard is uh, going to look like okay so this is how it looks like and in next session we are going to learn some of the other things how we can uh, make it even more dynamic or probably we can learn about uh, drill downing and some of the other important stuff thanks for watching Hello everyone, I hope you all are doing great. In today's session, we are going to be talking about Splunk base searches and how to use them. Uh, so base searches are very useful when you have some base data and you want to do a lot of analytics on that base data. Okay, so basically you are going to create a lot of different panels in a dashboard and all of those panels are in some way going to use the same base data. Okay, so in that sort of situation, it is very useful that you create a base search rather than each of the panel uh, running the search all over again and hitting or occupying or basically going to consume a lot of system resources because each time it is going to run the query and going to um, consume system resources going to hit your indexes 
and lots of other things which i guess you are probably aware of so this video is just gonna be you know syntax and semantics of how to use base searches now you can see the data which i have is tutorial data which i have downloaded from splunk website and then you can see here we have a lot of interesting fields so one of the field which we can see here is called action if you click on the action we can see that there are various actions which has happened okay so this is a transactional data which is about one website where there, there is a lot of you know activities which is being done so one of the activities add to cart then purchases view remove change quality etc okay uh, so what we want to do here is we want to analyze this base data from different angles so for example we may uh, be interested in seeing what are the top five actions or top 10 actions which have happened and then we may also want to see what are the top 10 uh, you know products which has been which has been being sold so for example we can go ahead and see what are the top 10 product ids which are being sold so there are various ways we can you know we can analyze this data and create our dashboard boards and as you can see that all of these data whatever analytics which we are going to see is actually going to use the same base data which is going to be coming from here okay so in that case what we can do is uh, first of all i'm just gonna uh, show you uh, let's say we want we want to see all the actions which are happening and we are just interested in top five actions so for that you can use top command and you need to provide the field name and here you can see that whatever the top action which has happened here you can see the count of those action and also you can see the percentage if you want to create a visualization then just click on visualization and you can uh, add the visualization of your choice so for example if you're interested in pie chart you can go ahead and use pie chart as well okay now uh, i'm gonna save it so for that you want to uh, click on save as and go ahead and click on dashboard panel so once you click on dashboard panel it is going to ask you whether you want to create a new dashboard or you are going to include this panel in one of the existing dashboards so i'm just going to uh, stay in new and i'm just going to uh, create a new dashboard and i'm going to call it demo base search okay and that's it we don't want to make any other changes here and click on save and after that there is option of view dashboard so i'm just going to open it in a new tab and here you can now uh, should be able to see uh, the dashboard which has been created okay we just have right now we just have only one panel now let's create another panel okay so i can see category id okay so probably we can just go ahead and see uh, you know top five category as well so for that we just need to you know add top and we need to specify you know whether we are interested in top 5 or top 10 or whatever so i'm gonna say top 5 in total we have around 8 to 10 categories that's the reason we need if you want to see only top 5 we need to specify top 5 in case of action we only had 5 actions so that's the reason i didn't specify 5 but yeah that's the way it works okay so here you can see also uh, we can see top five category ids which are there and also we can see the count and percentage now uh, if you want you can again go ahead and create a visualization so for example in this case let's say i'm just gonna use a bar chart and also if you want to uh, show the value over this bar chart in that case you can click on format and also here in show data value you need to click on on okay now let's just save it uh, click on save as click on dashboard panel and this time we are going to uh, select existing and we are just going to use our existing uh, dashboard which we created so which is called demo base search and i'm going to click on save and then i'm not going to open it this time just let let it just uh, close it and we are just going to create one more query and this time probably let me see what is the kind of data which we may want to use this time okay so uh, probably let's say we are interested in top 10 product ids for which uh, most number of transaction has happened okay so for that we can just uh, use product id and we can our query will be top 10 and we need to specify product id and that's it so now we are ready with all the three queries which we created and just give me a moment uh, this one i'm probably just gonna keep it as table and click on save go to dashboard panel and select existing select dashboard uh, select demo base search and click on save and now we can click on view dashboard and there's another tab which is open let me close this tab now you can see that you know this dashboard has already actually started getting little slower because what is happening is that for each each of these panel uh, it is running query and it is bringing all the data and it has to actually uh, go and scan through a lot of events okay so you can already see that uh, once we added three panels dashboard has become little slower uh, now what i'm going to show you uh, click on edit and one thing is probably we would like to do a bit of rearranging so i'm going to keep these panels side by side and also uh, 
in the late, latest version of uh, Splunk, we already have dark theme. So if you want to enable it, just enable dark theme, click on save. And then you also need to refresh. So it is already giving you option of refreshing it. Just click on refresh and then it is going to show you uh, basically going to be dark mode enabled in this case. And now I'm going to show you how we can use base searches. Okay. So now you can see all of these searches are running and it is, you know, it is, it has really become very slow. And if I click on edit, you can see we have two options here. We have UI, which is user interface, and then we have source. So I'm going to click on source. And once I click on source here, you can see if you scroll down, you can see that, you know, there are queries, uh, so this is one query which is actually using index main source and top action okay so this is showing us top actions panel and this is showing us top category panels and this is showing us a uh, top product id panel okay now what i want to do here is i want to you know take out this part and i want to keep this part in a base search okay so for that what you can do is let's copy this and just move uh, onto the top of the, you know, uh, or probably you can just go to second line and uh, after going to second line, you can just paste the base search. Okay. Or the easiest way actually is just copy this complete line. So copy this complete, you know, search, uh, search tag, I would say, and then you can specify an ID to this search. Okay. So I'm going to say search and we need to give a name to this search. So I'm going to say ID equal to and let's give it a name of base search okay and then what is happening here is here you just want to specify your base search you don't want to specify the complete uh, query here complete search query here so i'm just going to get rid of this top action and i know that you know this uh, base search okay whatever we have written here is being reused at multiple places okay so that's the reason i'm just going to keep it at one place and now in our later queries, we are just going to specify that we want to use this base search to perform uh, this search. Okay, so for that, what you need to do now is uh, you can first thing is you can get rid of this part because this part we have already used here in base search. So remove it. And now in the search, you need to add a base equal to and you need to give the name of the base uh, base id okay so whatever name you have given here here we have given id equal to base search so the same name we need to use here okay so what it means is you can actually have multiple base searches okay so you can define multiple base searches here and here you can use one or the other base search which you want to uh, refer refer to okay so uh, also, you can see here that we are getting errors or warnings here for these are the two fields. The reason being is that in the base search, we already have these, you know, uh, earliest and sample ratio included. That's the reason it is giving us error. Uh, so we need to get rid of this. So I'm going to delete it from here. And now you can see error has gone. Okay, so it is the same thing which we need to repeat for others as well. So here also, I'm just going to remove this base query. And also in search, I'm going to add base equal to base underscore search and also I'm gonna get rid of this and it is same thing which we need to do for third panel as well so I'm gonna say it's base equal to base search and let's get rid of this and let's also get rid of these okay so that's fine I think everything is gonna be working fine everything looks okay here we don't see any warning so now you can either click on save or you can just click on UI which is going to you know, show you the result so I'm also gonna just quickly save it now here we see that we are getting no result found so one thing which I have observed is that in this kind of scenario where you are having base search and then you directly have you know top or uh, yeah, yeah you are using top kind of query in that case you also need to specify table so here we also need to specify table star so what it is going to do is base search is going to basically return all the columns and then further operation is going to be performed here okay so this is something i'm not really sure of that whether in the you need to do it in all the scenario or not but in this scenario uh, definitely we need to add it and then we can click on save and let's run it again and this time hopefully we are going to see the results okay so as you can see now we have the results and also you can notice that this is a bit uh, faster uh, the reason for this being faster is that the base query is being uh, ran only once and then all the analytics is happening over that you know base data which is already stored in memory 
okay so that's the reason it is little faster so that's it in this video if you have any query feel free to write in the comment section i'll be more than happy to answer hello everyone i hope you all are doing great in today's video i'm going to be talking about make results command so make results command are very useful when you want to create some dummy data or because you want to create some test data and you want to just you know uh, play around with the data so whatever result which is generated by make results are uh, the result which is just kept in memory it is not stored anywhere or not indexed okay so for example if you just run make results it is just going to return you one time okay and uh, then you can also specify count equal to you know whatever number of events which you want to generate so for example let's say if i say count equal to 20 in that case it is going to generate 20 uh, events and also you can see that time for all of these are same so that's the reason it may not be useful for uh, you know using it as it is and you may want to uh, tweak it a bit uh, in in order to you know generate uh, time uh, for example maybe you know uh, in descending order based on minute by minute or whatever okay so for that what you can do is you can do use a stream stats and what stream stats uh, does is it is going to give you actually a count okay so it's it's more like a serial number uh, against each of the events so for example if i'm running it you can see that we are going to have a field which is going to be uh, called count and also you can see here we have uh, basically you know i call it serial number uh, because just counting uh, 1 2 3 4 up to 20 we have 20 events now what we can do is we can also uh, use eval statement so with eval statement we'll be able to modify the time so for example i can say time equal to uh, let's say time plus i want to add uh, this uh, you know whatever the value here is in the count i want to add that value in time so by default uh, underscore time is in epoch okay so what it means is that whatever value you add here is going to be in seconds so in this case i'm just going to say uh, time plus count and in this case also uh, notice here that it is going to show us future value uh, so if you want to show past value in that case rather than plus you can use minus so let's use minus and then run it and let's see what is the data we get this time okay so now you can see we have data of uh, 23 50 36 which is now and then all the remaining data is uh, reduced by one second okay so if you want to uh, reduce all of this time by one minute in that case you can uh, what you can do is you can do minus uh, count and you can multiply this count by 60 okay because this count is actually uh, representing seconds so if you multiply it by 60 it is going to become minutes so uh, let's run this and let's see what is the data which we see this time okay so here you can see we have uh, 2350 then we have data 2349 and so on and we in total we have 20 events uh, now you may also want to produce some more columns so you can do that as well for example uh, what we can do is uh, one thing which i forgot to mention is that you need to make sure that make results is the first command okay you can you cannot use make results later on for example uh, i cannot just cut it and put it here okay it is not going to work it is going to give us errors so make sure must be the first command yeah make results uh, should be the first command and now we are going to let's say add some value so i'm gonna say eval and let's say we add a uh, counter and we call it i'm going to say one two three four five six seven eight nine and ten okay and I'm also going to get rid of okay let's run it now and see how it works and then we are going to just change it a bit so for example here you can see we get data like this okay so uh, I'm not really interested in this data so first thing I'm just going to get rid of count and once we get rid of count and we run it again uh, then let's see how uh, how is the data at this time so for example uh, now we get this kind of data okay so one thing which uh, i'm gonna do is i'm gonna break this uh, data with space okay so uh, i want to show it not in a single row i want to uh, show each of the value in a different row okay so for that a uh, simple thing which we can do is we can say eval and we can say counter equal to and we want to use split function we want to split counter column with value of space and let's run it now and if we run it now it should be uh, showing us uh, like this 
okay so it is it has uh, broken up everything but it is showing everything under one row so now we need to use mv expand so we can say mv expand and we can say counter because this is the name of the column okay now run it again and this time we should be able to see all the values in a different row okay so you can see now we have some test data which is already generated which is having you know a counter column and count column and time column and uh, again you can use this kind of data or you can generate this kind of data for various purpose uh, maybe you want to do some testing or maybe you just want to uh, test some syntax of some of the functions which is available in Splunk or maybe you want to test some commands so uh, there can be any reason for which you want to make use of make results command so that's it in this video see you again in the next video hey everyone i hope you all are doing great in today's video we are going to be talking about scripted inputs in splunk so you must be wondering what is scripted inputs uh, so scripted input in basically in short is you create a script to pull some data and then you send the data to splunk for indexing okay so that's all it is there can be various requirements for using scripted inputs for example let's say you want to monitor some server where uh, you cannot install Splunk forwarders okay so it can be a legacy server and in that case you may need to create your own custom script to uh, bring CPU and memory related data and then put the data into Splunk so that can be one scenario or let's say you want to uh, pull the data from some REST API or from any application uh, for which you have to write some program and then you want to index that data to Splunk okay uh, so basically you can just write a program and in that program you can write any logic or any code to bring the data and put the data into Splunk. Okay, so one more scenario can be that you want to monitor some database or you want to you know, bring or you want to run some query on database, then whatever the result is, that result you want to uh, put it back in Splunk. Okay, so that can be done as well. Now, uh, creating a scripted input is fairly easy in uh, Splunk. All you have to do is you have to go inside the application in which you want to create uh, scripted input so for example in this case uh, I have just installed Splunk and by default if you install Splunk this is the architecture which is going to be or the folder navigation which is going to be on Windows so here I'm uh, on Splunk under Splunk go to etc and then you can go to apps under apps if you have installed your own custom apps and you want to keep a script there then you can do that as well in this scenario I'm just going to keep uh, application under a script under search application so for that go to search and then you need to go to bin directory okay so make sure you keep your script under bin directory so here i'm going to go to bin directory and to save time i have already created a python program so i'm just going to show you this python program i'm calling it get some ra random data dot pi and uh, let's just change it and let's call it uh, get app login data dot pi okay so uh, I have changed the name and now let's open this and see what is the content which is inside this uh, script. So actually the script is you know a very simple script. I haven't really written much uh, code inside this. So all it is doing is it is just you know uh, importing a couple of modules and after that it is just generating some random data. So the data uh, is in JSON format. I'm also going to run this Python program and show you what will be the output when this program is run. So let's run this program and let's see what happens. Okay, so here you can see when I ran this, uh, it has just given me one name which is app underscore two and it is saying user logged in is 83. So I'm, I'm generating this data uh, randomly. So if you run it again, it may return some different data. For example, it is now returning app one and it is returning user logged in is four. Okay, so this is just some random data which I want to generate by running this script and for that this is a code which i have written if you are interested you can just use this code or otherwise i know uh, you may want to write your own code so for that you need to know programming language either python or you can write the code in shell script or any other programming language as well okay so now let's go ahead and add this uh, script in splunk to get the data directly in splunk so for that what we need to do is we need to go to settings and then we need to go to data inputs so when you want to uh, read any sort of data you need to go to data inputs so that's the thumb rule so now we are going to go to data inputs and after that uh, you can just go ahead and move to scripts okay so there there are various other ways as well to just go directly to you know this place but yeah this is one of the way as well so here i can click on new local script and then i'm gonna you know uh, give the path of the script 
and then so on okay so let's see how it works so here uh, now you can see in the script path you need to give the path where you have kept your uh, executable so for example here uh, i remember that i have kept python script under apps search bin okay so i'm gonna select this and after you do that it is going to show you a list of all the programs which are available here so you can see these are all the python scripts are available and here you can see all of those script names here so here we just need to scroll down and select the app which we have created which is get app login data dot pi okay and then uh, in the interval you need to specify how frequent you want to run this script so for example let's say i want to run this script every 30 seconds or 20 seconds or 10 seconds so for example in this case i want to let's say uh, run it every 10 seconds so i'm just gonna say 10 and then you can click on next to move on to next page and in the next page it is going to ask you what is the source type so make sure if you have json data uh, you change it change the source type and select json and if you have uh, csv data then you can select those as well okay so any kind of data you can just index in json now uh, here we don't really need to make any changes uh, in index i'm just going to select main if you want to create a new index you can do that and that's it let's click on preview it is going to show you all the uh, option or settings which you have selected so everything looks okay to me i'm just going to go ahead and click on submit once we do that now it is saying script has been successfully created okay now we can click on start searching and we should be able to you know start running our search query to see whether we are receiving the data or not so let's see Okay, now search query is running and you can see we have already started receiving data. Okay, uh, and again you can also notice here that uh, we are having two fields. One is called name, other one is called user logged in. This is the same thing which I have shown you here on this, uh, when I ran this Python script here. Now what we can do is you can of course format the data like, you know, you format any other data. So you can uh, use uh, name and you can use users logged in and let's run it. Okay, now you can see it is showing you name and total number of users logged in. So this is the data which we were writing uh, or which is being written every 10 seconds to Splunk and that is the data which we see here. Uh, and now since you have the data here, you can perform any Splunk searches or Splunk command which you want to perform here on this data. Uh, so that's it in this video. If you have any query, feel free to write to me. Uh, one more thing uh, I want to tell you before I go uh, that if you want to, see, if you get any error in that case, you can go to uh, index equal to internal and then you can search for error okay so when you search for error if if there is any error in running your script in that case it is going to show those errors here and you'll be able to know if there is you know if anything has gone wrong with your script but in my case everything is okay we are able to see the uh, scripts output so we don't really see any error okay at least related to that program so there are various errors available here as well but it is for different thing which we don't really need to worry about at the moment so that's it in the video see you again in the next video Hey everyone, I hope you all are doing great. In today's video, we are going to be talking about scripted inputs in Splunk. So you must be wondering what is scripted inputs. Uh, so scripted input in basically in short is you create a script to pull some data and then you send the data to Splunk for indexing. Okay, so that's all it is. There can be various requirements for using scripted inputs. For example, let's say you want to monitor some server where uh, you cannot install Splunk forwarders okay so it can be a legacy server and in that case you may need to create your own custom script to uh, bring cpu and memory related data and then put the data into Splunk so that can be one scenario or let's say you want to uh, pull the data from some rest api or from any application uh, for which you have to write some program and then you want to index that data to Splunk okay uh, so basically you can just write a program and in that program you can write any logic or any code to bring the data and put the data into Splunk. 
okay so one more uh, scenario can be that you want to monitor some database or you want to you know bring or you want to run some query on database then whatever the result is that result you want to uh, put it back in splunk okay so that can be done as well now uh, creating a scripty input is fairly easy in uh, splunk all you have to do is you have to go inside the application in which you want to create uh, scripted input so for example in this case uh, I have just installed Splunk and by default if you install Splunk this is the architecture which is going to be or the folder navigation which is going to be on Windows so here I'm uh, on Splunk under Splunk go to etc and then you can go to apps under apps if you have installed your own custom apps and you want to keep a script there then you can do that as well in this scenario I'm just going to keep uh, application under a script under search application so for that go to search and then you need to go to bin directory okay so make sure you keep your script under bin directory so here i'm going to go to bin directory and to save time i have already created a python program so i'm just going to show you this python program i'm calling it get some ra random data dot pi and uh, let's just change it and let's call it uh, get app login data dot pi okay so uh, I have changed the name and now let's open this and see what is the content which is inside this uh, script. So actually the script is you know, a very simple script. I haven't really written much uh, code inside this. So all it is doing is it is just you know uh, importing a couple of modules and after that it is just generating some random data. So the data uh, is in JSON format. I'm also going to run this Python program and show you what will be the output when this program is run. So let's run this program and let's see what happens. Okay, so here you can see when I ran this, uh, it has just given me one name which is app underscore two and it is saying user logged in is 83. So I'm, I'm generating this data uh, randomly. So if you run it again, it may return some different data. For example, it is now returning app one and it is returning user logged in is four. Okay, so this is just some random data which I want to generate by running this script and for that this is a code which i have written if you are interested you can just use this code or otherwise i know uh, you may want to write your own code so for that you need to know programming language either python or you can write the code in shell script or any other programming language as well okay so now let's go ahead and add this uh, script in splunk to get the data directly in splunk so for that what we need to do is we need to go to settings and then we need to go to data inputs so when you want to uh, read any sort of data you need to go to data inputs so that's the thumb rule so now we are going to go to data inputs and after that uh, you can just go ahead and move to scripts okay so there there are various other ways as well to just go directly to you know this place but yeah this is one of the way as well so here i can click on new local script and then i'm gonna you know uh, give the path of the script and then so on okay so let's see how it works so here uh, now you can see in the script path you need to give the path where you have kept your uh, executable so for example here uh, i remember that i have kept python script under apps search bin okay so i'm gonna select this and after you do that it is going to show you a list of all the programs which are available here so you can see these are all the python scripts are available and here you can see all of those script names here so here we just need to scroll down and select the app which we have created which is get app login data dot pi okay and then uh, in the interval you need to specify how frequently you want to run this script so for example let's say i want to run this script every 30 seconds or 20 seconds or 10 seconds so for example in this case i want to let's say uh, run it every 10 seconds so i'm just gonna say 10 and then you can click on next to move on to next page and in the next page it is going to ask you what is the source type so make sure if you have json data uh, you change it change the source type and select json and if you have uh, csv data then you can select those as well okay so any kind of data you can just index in json now uh, here we don't really need to make any changes uh, in index i'm just going to select main if you want to create a new index you can do that and that's it let's click on preview it is going to show you all the uh, option or settings which you have selected so everything looks okay to me i'm just going to go ahead and click on submit once we do that now it is saying script has been successfully created so let's see what happens actually behind the scene. Yeah, so when you actually create uh, a local uh, input after that, if you go to local, okay, uh, then here you can see inputs.conf and if you open it, you should be able to see the details of the script which you have just you know put in. Uh, okay, so I don't really see anything here. Oh, 
okay now we can click on start searching and we should be able to you know start running our search query to see whether we are receiving the data or not so let's see okay now search query is running and you can see we have already started receiving data okay uh, and again you can also notice here that uh, we are having two fields one is called name other one is called user logged in this is the same thing which i have shown you here on this uh, when i ran this python script here now what we can do is you can of course format the data like you know you format any other data so you can use a name and you can use users logged in and let's run it okay now you can see it is showing you name and total number of users logged in so this is the data which we were writing or which is being written every 10 seconds to splunk and that is the data which we see here uh, and now since you have the data here you can perform any splunk searches or splunk command which you want to perform here on this data uh, so that's it in this video if you have any query feel free to write to me uh, one more thing uh, i want to tell you before i go uh, that if you want to see, if you get any error in that case you can go to uh, index equal to internal and then you can search for error okay so when you search for error if if there is any error in running your script in that case it is going to show those errors here and you'll be able to know if there is you know if anything has gone wrong with your script but in my case everything is okay we are able to see the uh, scripts output so we don't really see any error okay at least related to that program so there are various errors available here as well but it is for different thing which we don't really need to worry about at the moment so that's it in the video see you again in the next video we are going to discuss about so in this session we are going to discuss about how you can use splunk rest api in order to perform any search so typically you will perform a search using a splunk search application and here whatever your search query is you are going to write that and then once you click on search you get the result uh, down here okay so now let's say for some reason you want the same thing to be happening using uh, some sort of programming language using rest api so i'm going to show you how you can do that so uh, let's first understand high level process of uh, performing a splunk search using rest api so uh, on a high level or broad level there are three steps which you need to take care of so first step is that you are going to make a search request and to that search request you are going to assign an sid so sid is more like a you can say search identifier okay so search identifier is going to be unique for any search so let's say if you are performing hundreds hundreds of search so you'll be able to uh, uh, distinguish between one search to another using sid okay and then step number two is going to be uh, checking the status of search request using the sid whether the request is still processing or whether the request has been completed so typically when you perform a small search the search gets completed instantaneously but sometimes when you're performing huge uh, search or probably you are performing loss and loss of aggregation search may take some time to uh, complete okay so typically in those sort of scenario you will need to uh, take care or you will need to check whether the search has completed or not and once the search has completed then you can move on to the third step which is fetching the search results okay so these are the three steps which we need to perform programmatically and for all of these three things there are separate endpoints or rest api we can say that so i'm just going to introduce that to you so first thing is we are going to make a search request and this is the endpoint which we need to use for that so just notice one thing here if you just go to a splunk url so you will notice here splunk url uses a default port of 8000 but however when you are performing uh, or when you are interacting with splunk rest api in that case the port changes it changes to 8089 and also the protocol which you need to use is https okay so these are the clear changes which we can see which we uh, which is different from when you are making a search using a graphical interface now other thing which you need to notice here is uh, after service ns i have uh, put brackets here 
So here you need to uh, give the name of the user. So whichever Splunk user you, your ID has been created with, you need to provide that user. So I'm just going to put user ID here. Okay, so here you need to replace it with your user ID. And after that, it's just search, search jobs. Okay, so you are going to make a request of search and you are going to provide the complete search string to this uh, API. Okay, so I'll show you how that is going to work, but let me explain you the next API to you. So in the next API, once you make this request, you are going to uh, call this API. Okay, and if you see that after the jobs, you need to provide SID. Okay, so this SID is going to be uh, the unique search ID using which you are going to uh, check the status of this search which you have been performing. Okay, and the third step is that once your search is completed, you are going to use this uh, endpoint which is as you can see in the end it is uh, slash results. So you are going to use this endpoint to see the result of your query. Okay, now let's uh, write a small Python program to see how all of these works. Uh, so for the search query, I'm just going to use the same query which we have used here in the search window. And now if you see the complete program is uh, probably a bit uh, complicated. Okay, it may look a bit complicated initially, but I'm going to explain it to you. So I'm just going to copy all of these and let's paste it here on uh, PyCharm. I'm using Python language, but you can literally use any language. It is going to be, I mean, the mechanism is going to be the same. Only if you are performing this uh, using any other programming language, then probably the syntax is going to change. Now, if you see here, uh, first thing which we have done is we have imported a library, which is request library and time library. These are the libraries which we are going to use in Python. And after that, we have declared few of the variables. So in the unique ID, I have given SID001. Uh, so it can be any unique ID. Okay, so this unique ID we are going to assign to our search. Okay, so using this unique ID, we'll be able to see the result of this unique ID or we'll be able to know the status of this unique ID. Now, username and password is uh, Splunk username and password using which you are going to be uh, basically logging to Splunk. So whatever your username and password is, you can assign that to a variable or you can directly type in a endpoint, but I prefer it assigning it to a variable because that's a neat and clean way of working. Now in the search query, if you see, we have provided this complete uh, search string. Okay. Now one thing if you notice here is uh, here in the search window, you don't typically start it with search, but what Splunk does is Splunk prefixes search whenever you run any search command. Okay, so uh, regardless of I type this query beginning with search or without search, it is just going to give me the same result. However, when you are performing uh, this operation using REST API, that time you need to make sure you uh, started with search. Okay, so rest of the thing is same. And one more thing to notice here is that uh, for each slash I have put here two times. So if you notice here in the query, I'm using double slashes. So that's why I need to double it and make it four times here. This is something to do with Python because if you have to do one slash here in Python, you have to type it two times. So that's how Python works. But maybe in other programming language, you may not need to type it two times. So whatever your query is, you can just make sure that query is working in a search result here and that should be enough. Then you can just paste it here. And we are assigning this complete search to a variable which is called search query. Okay, now uh, next things which we need to take care is we need to know the payload which we are going to pass. So payload is uh, going to have some properties and I'm going to explain these properties to you. So here in the payload, uh, one thing here is that we are assigning this complete payload to post data variable. Okay, and in this payload, we have some very important properties which is going to decide how this search is going to work. Okay, so if you notice here is we are having ID and this ID uh, we are we are assigning the value of unique ID. So unique ID is equal to SID001. So this is the value which is going to be assigned to this ID. Okay, now in the max count uh, we are uh, telling here is 200 but it doesn't really matter in this case. So max count is basically going to let this uh, endpoint know that how many number of records this result should return. Okay, so let's say if you have a search query which is going to return 5000 uh, records, but you are interested in only top 200 or top 100, then you can provide that number here. 
So in my case, if you just go to this result, you can see we have only three records. So whatever value I have provided here is doesn't really matter. But yes, you have this option available. So you can restrict the number of uh, search results which you want to see. Okay, now you we have another key which is called search and here we are saying this search is equal to search query. So this search query is again a variable to which we have assigned this value. And then here we are telling it what is going to be the earliest time and what is going to be the latest time. So if you go again to Splunk search query, so here if you see we usually select this uh, time frame. Okay, so whatever the time frame which we select is you can pass that using this endpoint as well. So I'm just gonna go here. So I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, we were here. So here in the earliest time, I'm telling it that I want to uh, start from minus 24 hours. So it is almost 24 hours in the past, starting from that point until now. Okay. So latest time is going to be now. So this search query is going to perform from now until minus 24 hours. Okay. So that is equivalent to you selecting last 24 hours here okay so this is the exactly uh, this is the exact result we should be expecting when we run our uh, our query using rest apis now i'm just gonna copy remaining code here now here in the remaining code it is more to do with uh, python synth uh, syntax but the thing which we are doing here is uh, pretty simple so now here you can see in the Splunk search base URL, as I explained you the URL, so we are going to use the same URL. Okay, I'm just gonna show that to you again. So this is the first endpoint which we are going to use in this programming language. Okay, so if you see here in this endpoint, I'm replacing this uh, with the username. Okay, so this is Python syntax of replacing any value to a variable value. Okay, but in your case, it might be different. And if you want to hard code this value here rather than using this username variable, you can do that as well. Okay, so just remember this username is equal to this value and this value is going to get replaced here to form complete Splunk search base URL. And this everything we are assigning again to a variable which is called Splunk search base URL. And now we are going to make a REST API call. So we are assigning this to a variable which is called response and this is and we are making a post request which is called requests dot post and here we are assigning this uh, url okay so this is a url which is basically going to get replaced here and in the data we are passing this complete payload okay so this is the payload which we need to pass and verify we are setting it to false because if you don't set it to false you are going to get certificate related issues so you can set it to false and in the authentication, we are going to provide username and password. So remember here I have given variable names because I have already set the variable value to the username and password. Okay, now we can print it. So I'm going to print response.txt and we will notice what is the output which we get. So I'm going to run it and let's see what happens when we run it. Okay, so this is the output which I have received when, when we ran it. So you can see when we run it, this is what we get. So in the response, we only get SID. Okay, so this is the same SID which we have assigned it. So if you get that same SID, it means your search request has been placed successfully in Summit. And I'm sorry, in Splunk. And Splunk is working on, uh, Splunk is working on to perform this search. Okay, so now we can move on to our next step. So now I'm going to see whether this search is completed or not. Okay, so in order to see the search is completed or not, we have the endpoint. Okay, so this is the endpoint which I explained to you. Okay, so oh, one more thing is if you want, you can actually use this uh, endpoint and you can uh, directly paste it in the, in the browser. Okay, so I'm just going to paste it in the browser and I'm going to replace this SID with the actual SID. So remember the SID which we have here is this SID. Okay, so I'm going to replace it with this SID. And also here we need to replace this with the username. So username is uh, this. And now if I hit enter, let's see what is the output which we get. Okay, so you need to provide username and password here as well for authentication. And I'm just gonna uh, copy the password from here.
okay so now you can see this is what you get so this is exactly what you are going to get uh, when you are running endpoint uh, this endpoint as well okay so here the thing which we are interested in is called dispatch state okay so we want to make sure dispatch state is equal to done okay so if it is in progress or any other state it means search is still processing okay so in this case we can see that this search has already completed and that's why dispatch state is, is equal to done okay but for a uh, you know this query was very small that's why almost like instantaneously when we ran this uh, we already got dispatch state of none but uh, done but imagine when you have a pretty large uh, search which actually takes probably 10 to 15 minutes to run in that scenario it is better that you loop through uh, you you run a while loop and you just see whether this endpoint is returning dispatch state of done or not okay so if it is returning done then you can make sure that okay this search has completed successfully and then you can move on to the next step okay so that's why you can see here the program might look a bit complicated but all what i'm doing here is uh, we are actually just creating a while loop and in the while loop every five seconds i'm uh, checking whether the status of this endpoint is done or not okay so i'm just gonna paste this code here okay so here what we are doing is we are assigning uh, we are just creating a variable and assigning it a value of none okay so uh, this variable is called is job completed and then we are creating a while loop and we are saying run this while loop until the value of is job completed is not equal to done okay so after this i'm giving a, a sleep time of five seconds so basically we are checking this endpoint okay every five seconds to see whether our query search query has completed or not okay now the everything else is pretty straightforward here whatever we are again making a request a post request here we are uh, assigning a payload okay which is job status the endpoint is job status base url the payload is get data and in the get data you can see all which we have here is called output mode json okay so that's all we need here and now i can just run it and let's see what what is the output which we get okay now you can see we are getting current job status is done okay so which means it this search has uh, completed successfully okay now one thing you will notice here is that uh, whatever the response which we are getting i'm converting that response to json and inside the json i'm going to entry zero content dispatch state because i know whatever the output which we get okay this is the place where we get this dispatch state okay so you can use the same thing and as a beginner you don't really need to go into more detail you will uh, understand it when you're running this program yourself is uh, pretty straightforward okay so now once uh, this job search is equal to done then it is going to move to the next step and then in the next step we are going to use this search result okay so i'm just going to copy paste this code and let's use it here so now uh, here if you see we have created a variable which is called splunk summary base url and here base url is going to be little different so in the end you can see we have keyword which is called results okay so again moving back to the example which i shown you so this is the exact uh, endpoint which i'm using and here uh, you can see we are assigning username and unique id okay so unique id or sid is very important that is the only way to track whether our job has completed or not and that is also uh, we are going to use when we want to get the results back okay so now here we are creating another variable and we are making a get request and also notice here uh, that when we are making a, a re get request we are also passing username password we are setting verification to false and in the data we are setting it to get data okay so get data i'm not going to initialize again so get data if you see we have already initialized here and the same thing is going to work in this case as well okay so the only thing which we need to pass it as a payload is uh, output mode uh, to be equal to json so that's all
and now if I run it we are going to get the result but we are not going to see the result because these two lines are commented so let me uncomment these lines okay so now I'm going to run it and let's see how it works okay so it has given us SID and then it shown us that current job status is done and this is the output which we have received okay so if I just go to this search here on the screen you can see that we have level equal to info error and warning and count is equal to 88272 and here also in this result you can see we have level equal to info error and warning and we have count is equal to 88272 and also the percentage values are also exactly the same which we have seen here in this result now notice one thing that you may get some extra output you know when, when we are when you are querying using uh, APIs for example in this case I'm also getting this uh, total count okay which is equal to 117 but here in the graphical interface you are not going to see that because some of the things usually on the graphical interface is hidden for uh, better visibility purposes but you are going to get all the results plus you may get uh, something extra but this that shouldn't be bothering you because whatever information which you need is already there as part of the search result okay so hope this was useful if you have any query please feel free to ask in the comment section and i'll be more than happy to help you you can so in this session i'm going to show you how you can configure splunk to send email alerts now first thing which you need to configure email alerts is smtp details so i assume whichever project you are working in from that you already have got smtp details However, if you are doing it for your practice and you don't have any SMTP details, then you can just Google free SMTP and then you are going to see list of available SMTP providers, which gives you ability to send uh, some free emails on daily basis. So I'm not going to go into details of how you can sign up to one of these SMTP providers. You can just explore it on your own. So once you have SMTP details, all you need to do is you need to go to Splunk, then go to settings and then go to server settings so I'm going to open it in a new tab and I'll just close this tab so yeah so here now we need to go to email settings so I already have SMTP details uh, from my SMTP providers and this is the mailing host of SMTP provider and this is the port which I have been provided so remember uh, in your case details might be different but uh, here you need to provide the SMTP host name along with the port name okay so if it is SSL enabled it might be uh, working on port 465 so whatever details which you have got when you sign up for free SMTP providers you can provide that detail here or if your organization has given you SMTP details then you can provide those things here now in the username you can uh, type the username uh, which you have received from your organization or from your SMTP provider so I'm going to type here email at itpanther.com that's the username I have and for the password I have a temporary password which is available here so I'm just going to copy paste uh, this temporary password here and then you need to confirm on this password so you can paste the same password again here now here in the allowed domains if you want to perform some filtering you can use it but for now we are not going to go, uh, go into more detail of this so you can just skip it and then if you just scroll down here in the send email as you can uh, write down the email using which you want to send uh, emails okay so this is the email id is going to be shown when a recipient receives the email now in the footer if you want to uh, change these things you can change it but for now I'm not going to change it it's pretty straightforward whenever you receive an email in the footer you are going to see these things and if you want to change it you can change it okay now if you if I just scroll down uh, there is PDF report settings so for now uh, we are just going to leave this as well because we are just going to focus on uh, SMTP integration so remember the changes which we have made here is we have just added mailing host and we have added the port okay and then we have provided username and password so that's all the details which we needed and now we can click on save and uh, so once it is done we don't really need to shut down or restart a Splunk okay so it's just like uh, takes effect immediately and then we are going to go to that Splunk search 
and here you can see this is a Splunk search which I have performed. Now if you want to quickly uh, just test whether you are able to send email or not, in that case you can use a send email command. Okay, so I'm going to show you the syntax of that. I'm just going to go to new line and then we are going to add this send email. Okay, so in send email command we need to uh, give the email ID to which we want to send the email. So here you can see I have just used Mailinator. So if you don't know about Mailinator, Mailinator is basically uh, uh, gives you a free public mailbox. And you just need to type anything. So in this case I have typed, I'm just gonna type this and it's going to quickly create a free public email box. Okay, so this Mailinator is useful for uh, testing purpose whenever you want to just uh, see whether you are receiving emails or not and you don't really want to use your actual email id okay so you can use mailinator in those cases uh, now here in the two i have given this uh, mailbox so i should be receiving uh, mail uh, here but you can change it to whatever email address you want and in the server again uh, since we are just testing it so here in the server again you need to provide your smtp uh, server details along with the port and in the send results you can set it to true in the inline you can set it to true in the format you need to set it to table so we get all this data in a tabular format in our email okay so this is only for testing purpose when you want to set email alerts you don't really need to uh, add these things this is only to test whether your smtp integration is working or not so now i'm going to uh, click on search and then we should be receiving an email here so let's just see whether we receive an email or not and it does take few seconds okay to process this so we can see here it is still under processing and we should be receiving an email on this mailbox uh, pretty soon okay so it says there is some error it is saying authentication failed so uh, we just need to go back to uh, here in the email settings I just need to make sure whatever the password which I have typed is correct. So I'm just going to copy paste this again. And I'm just going to quickly paste the password here again. And yeah, that's all we needed. We can just click on save. Probably when last time I copied a password, something went wrong. That's why we were uh, getting the error. Now I'm going to click on this uh, search again and hopefully this time we receive email. Okay, yeah, we have received email this time. So uh, probably last time it was something wrong with the password. So now if I click here on this email, you can see this is the data which I have received. Okay, so this data is exactly same which we have, uh, which we can see here in the search result as well. Okay, so uh, what it means is that our SMTP email integration is perfectly working. Now in next video, I'm going to show you how we can automatically send alerts based on uh, our search results. And uh, we don't really need to use uh, this, you know, send email command. Okay. So stay tuned and see you in the next video. So if you want to learn Splunk as a beginner, in that case, there are three courses which is free and I'm going to recommend these courses. And these courses are available on Splunk official website. It is completely free. And along with the course completion, they are going to give you a completion certificate, which is going to be, of course, more valuable if you do a certification from Udemy or from YouTube. Uh, of course, I'm not saying that you should not do certification from uh, Udemy or any other website. You can do that as well. But uh, if you are working on Splunk and you have certification from Splunk, then that's going to have more weightage and that's going to be more useful. So apart from that, the courses are really uh, great. I haven't really seen this quality of content on any of the YouTube channel or any of uh, Udemy or Coursera websites. So the quality is great and they also receive feedback. So if you want to give them feedback on the, uh, their course quality, they are going to take that into consideration and going to improve it. Now let's talk about all the three uh, completion certification which I have achieved and I just actually did it in uh, less than 12 hours actually because 
Uh, the reason is that I'm already a bit aware of Splunk. Okay, I'm not going to say that I'm a, I'm an expert in Splunk uh, because that really needs experience and time to work on Splunk before you really get uh, before you can in fact really call yourself an expert. So in this case, I'm just going to talk about uh, first certification, which is going to be which is called actually Splunk 7.x Fundamentals Part One. So in this one, they are going to tell you everything about uh, Splunk searches and all these basic fundamentals about how you uh, pull the data into Splunk, how you get the data back from Splunk, how you can create dashboards, how you can query the data. So all those sort of details are available in this course. And within uh, this is actually four hour course, which you can do uh, probably you can do in a couple of days if you are really enthusiastic about this course or if let's say you don't get much time in that case anyways Splunk they give you 30 days of validity so you can do this course 30 days from the time of registration or the date of registration so using this course you will be able to understand Splunk and you will be able to you know use Splunk in a good way and you'll be able to perform different sorts of queries you'll be having uh, idea about lookups you are going to understand a bit about indexing and all those stuff Okay, so this certification is uh, pretty useful, especially you are a Splunk beginner. So this is the first thing which you should be doing. And next thing is uh, about Splunk infrastructure overview. Okay, this certificate or this course rather is going to be pretty useful for uh, from admin point of view. If you are a Splunk admin or you want to begin your career in Splunk administration, then this is the course which you should be doing. And after this course, you can of course move on to other uh, Splunk administration courses which are available on this uh, website as a paid course or you can move on to Udemy and buy uh, some of the courses which are available as, uh, for Splunk admin. Okay, and uh, in this course you are going to learn about installing Splunk, installing uh, Splunk uh, agents which are actually called Splunk forwarders and after that you are going to learn how to do some of the configuration you are going to also understand about clustering clustering of different components uh, such as a uh, splunk or uh, uh, search heads and uh, other components such as forwarder so forward uh, they are going to give you idea about all those things and from an admin point of view this course uh, should be your first course which you should be doing and it is a small i mean it is a short course it is only 2 hours of course and but this gives you a lot of clarity about how Splunk works, how the Splunk architecture is and how you can become a Splunk admin. Okay. The third course was actually is uh, pretty useful, especially if you are interested in machine learning and AI and those sort of stuff. The certification was about a Splunk UBT or UBA you can call. This is Splunk user behavior analytics. And in this one you are going to see how security Splunk security admin or how uh, basically how you do Splunk security related things and how you identify outlier user or how you identify any security breaches so all those sort of information is available uh, in this course okay and all these three courses are available for free and it is really so much great in quality and it really the total amount of time you need to spend on these courses probably going to be a couple of days but the amount of knowledge which you are going to get is probably going to be uh, way higher and after doing this course you are going to be very comfortable in Splunk and of course you can do other certification as well if you are on the path of making your career in Splunk uh, in next video probably go, we are going to talk about Splunk certification I have discussed with uh, one of my friends who has done a Splunk uh, who is now actually a Splunk certified admin and we are going to listen to his experience we are going to understand and we are going to see how he uh, approached his certification how much time it took him for the preparation and what are the career opportunities which he's looking forward uh, to after doing uh, Splunk admin certification so stay tuned in the next video if you like this video do comment and let me know about this video and uh, if you need anything or you need any uh, clarity or you need you you want me to clarify anything you can just write in the comment section either i'm going to answer it or i'll i'm going to get in touch with one of the splunk certified admins and going to uh, get all your queries answered so thank you so much for watching